Good morning. I'm Sheila Watson, Deputy Director of the FIA Foundation, a UK-based philanthropy which is committed to promoting safe and sustainable mobility across the world. Welcome to today's session on transport and health, and thanks very much for joining from wherever you are across the globe. We know very well the impact of transportation on the health of our planet. It's responsible for almost a quarter of direct CO2 emissions from fuel combustion and on-road vehicles account for nearly three quarters of that. So we've spoken as a sector of the need to avoid, shift and improve our mobility patterns to get those emissions down to zero. But have we given as much thought to how transportation, how we move around, affects our own health? 300 million children currently live in areas where outdoor air pollution exceeds international guidelines by at least six times. And the largest part of that pollution comes from those dirty vehicles. One in four adults, which is 1.4 billion people around the world, and more than 80% of adolescents across the world are not active enough uh, and are getting sick as a result. And often they're not active because the options to be more active are simply not appealing or in many cases, they're not safe. So our planet gets sick and we get sick and we struggle to deal with the causes in the transport sector whilst health professionals struggle to deal with the impacts in their sector. When in fact the solution for both of these forms of ill health are very much the same. We need to shift from motorised vehicles to more active mobility. We need to walk more, cycle more, dance more, hop more, skip more, move more, and that will cut emissions and it'll get us fit. Reducing the pollution coming from vehicles will reduce some of the short-lived climate pollutants which are forcing climate change and they'll also clean up what we breathe and that will help our health as well. And lower speeds and fair infrastructure, which allows for modes other than cars, trucks and motorised vehicles will keep us safer and get us moving in a low carbon fashion. So common issues, common solutions and common cause. And that's why we at FIA Foundation believe that a joint push from our two sectors for safe and healthy streets for everyone, especially the most vulnerable, young people and children is absolutely essential. And today's panel is going to focus very much on those issues and how we can work together in the future as two crucial sectors. And I very much look forward to discussing those ideas further. So now I'll hand over to Marusha, uh, the Director General of SLOCAT, the Sustainable Low Carbon Transport uh, Organization to introduce the rest of our session and our very exciting keynote speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sheila. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, perhaps even good night for some of you the global audience that is joining us these days. Well, by now you know where you are. You are in the middle of en route to COP26, uh, the co-creation of many different uh, organizations that have come together uh, to try to make up for the absence of COP this year and uh, keep the momentum going and make sure that we can all get ready uh, for uh, increased cooperation across different stakeholders and accelerated transformation towards the decarbonization of transport. So we're gonna start uh, a journey together two and a half hours, in which the idea is to try to put ourselves a bit closer in a pathway in which a decarbonization of transport and health are understood as almost inextricably linked and whether the two communities that are behind them can actually collaborate a bit better and, and do uh, things in the, in the long term uh, uh, together. Uh, the idea for us therefore is to try to identify entry points that could increase policy coherence across that nexus, across that link of transport decarbonization and, and health. Let me uh, encourage you all to contribute to an engaging session, please. Use the chat box function, use the Q&A function. We will make sure that we will bring those uh, comments, say uh, the moderators, both Sheila and I, and that we will pass on your questions to our uh, lovely set of speakers. As Sheila was saying, we have quite an impressive lineup and we don't want to miss the opportunity of you to enjoy all that. But before we go actually into the format of panels, um, we are actually honored to, uh, to, to present to you today a video by Miss uh, Salika Mandela. 
Ms. Solika Mandela, it's, um, as, as you may know, uh, she's the FIA Foundation Ambassador on Safe and Sustainable Mobility and Young People. But you might also know her as the South African writer, activist, and the granddaughter of Nelson Mandela that she's. She's going to share with us quite a personal story. Uh, video in, please. Hello, everyone. First, I want to thank the SLOCAD partners and the FIA Foundation for inviting me to take part in this important event. It's a great honor to speak alongside such distinguished experts on transport, public health, and the environment. I don't claim to be such an expert. Allow me instead, in this session linking transport, the climate crisis, and our health, to give you the perspective of a campaigner on child's rights, my experience as a South African, and most importantly, my plea for action as a mother. Across my continent, we're suffering the effects of a transport system which is no way designed for people or for the planet. You'll know if you visit our cities. Just go out on a street in Johannesburg at rush hour, on a highway in Nairobi, in Lagos, or Accra, and try to breathe the air. If rather than sit in the car in traffic, you instead try to walk, people would think you were either mad or you were poor. Our current situation is a disaster both for our health and for the climate. You don't have to visit our cities for long to see how utterly unsustainable it is. In my campaigning, we've been calling for cities and governments to provide every single child with a safe and healthy journey to school. You would think this would be an obvious commitment for our leaders to make, but sadly, millions of children are denied this basic and fundamental right. Ours is an agenda which links safety, air quality, and the environment. Let me tell you about my own experience. I've seen what our children face every single day on Africa's polluted and congested roads. Earlier this year, I had the privilege of working with our partner, the AMEND NGO, on their project in Accra, Ghana. At the Oblogo cluster of schools, just an hour from the city center, I saw children, little ones, confronting high-speed traffic as they walked to their classes. Every day, they were subjected to the threat of road traffic injury. But it's not just an immediate threat they face. It's one which poses a long-term impact to their health and it places their future and the environment in jeopardy. You see them waiting to cross, confronting the traffic, covering their eyes, their faces, to protect them from the thick black exhaust fumes of the heavy trucks dominating the road outside their school. In one case at Oblogo, a cement truck with brake failure had lost control and plowed into a primary school classroom. Two pupils had been killed and several injured as the roads were so unsafe. There was nowhere to cross. There was no safe space for them to walk. Rather than our children being at the center of our concerns, they were at best an afterthought and at worst an inconvenience. This is a story which is repeated across the fast growing cities of my continent. Our transport systems are primarily concerned about moving thousands upon thousands of cars and trucks. They're focused on how to fuel the engines of growth and economic development. Too often, we forget about people. We forget about our planet. But we can and we must find a more sustainable approach. At the Child Health Initiative, we look for a different path. We've been advocating for investments in walking and cycling infrastructure particularly around schools. We believe that pedestrians and cyclists must be given more priority in our policies and in our planning. We can shift to a more sustainable approach all around, one which tackles road traffic injury, which can help clear the air we breathe, promote physical activity and protect the environment. This is the approach taken by the Share the Road initiative involving UN Environment and the FIA Foundation. With a strong presence in Africa, it is a positive example. 
Share the Road supports cities and governments to move away from prioritizing cars and instead invest in walking and cycling. We know that our dependency on vehicles is fueling climate change. But our cities often need help in making the shift. As with our experience in Ghana, we know that it's the poorest who are suffering the most. They're the ones exposed to the highest levels of air pollution and traffic injury, to the most unhealthy and unsustainable transport. I think it's worth recalling the reflections of my grandfather as they are most relevant to the situation we face. He gave an address to the World Summit on Sustainable Development nearly two decades ago. And in his speech, he noted that when he returned to Kuno, the place of his birth and childhood, it was both the poverty of the people as well as the devastation of the natural environment that caused him deep pain. Almost 20 years on, perhaps we need to take a hard look at ourselves and ask what progress has been made. I've seen just how unsustainable our transport systems are, but I've also seen that we have the solutions we need our transport planners and our policy makers to prioritize health and the environment. And in the crisis we face today, this is ever more important. They can be a greener, cleaner alternative and one which makes economic sense. As we and our partners are showing, it can and it must be done for everyone, rich or poor. We call for a more sustainable approach both for our children right now and for the future of our world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Mandela. So you would agree uh, with me that that was quite a powerful message. And perhaps the question we are left with as we start this session about a deep linkages between transport decarbonization and health is whether we really want to be a society in which our children are are afterthought, and even worse, the society in which we have the solutions to overcome that and to make sure that that is not the case. So it is my honor now to introduce Dr. Fiona Fu, who is the head of unit for physical activity in the World Health Organization. Uh, Fiona is gonna share with us a bit of, a, of an overview of where things are, or where these linkages are, what is the global situation on health, and how actually acting better in this nexus between transport decarbonization and health can help us recover from the situation we are facing and actually overcome any other similar situations that of course we don't want to live in the future but that we know might be there. The floor is to you Fiona please. Thank you very much indeed uh, and a very good morning to all the uh, delegates attending uh, this third day. Um, I'm very pleased to join you from WHO in Geneva and bring the voice and to represent many at WHO across various different departments and divisions and relevant areas that uh, are working hard on this issue and find it of the utmost importance. May I extend my thanks to the organizers, to SLOCAT and the moderators, and agree with your remark. What a passionate um, and compelling opening uh, message from Zolika. It is so important uh, today uh, as we face this unprecedented challenge of global health to work together. And I hope I can share with you what WHO is doing, uh, inspire you and engage with you in the today's discussion and going forward on the importance of health and transport and the environment. Um, I don't want to take the precious minutes I've been offered to outline too much of what you are already seeing on a daily basis in the news, but to state the obvious, the world is facing extraordinary, unprecedented global health challenges, public health challenges, described as a syndemic because prior to COVID, we already had the impacts of climate change, not receiving the attention uh, and action it should, including on the, the uh, non-motorized transport uh, opportunities there. But we were also facing a pandemic of NCDs, the non-communicable diseases, which earlier remarks have already introduced. <clears throat> 
heart disease, diabetes, stroke and cancers, which cause the largest uh, burden of uh, death and um, morbidity. 70% uh, of deaths are due to non-communicable disease, 41 million deaths a year, and 15 million of those deaths are between the ages of 30 and 70. And we re regard those as premature and preventable. COVID, unexpected by some, forecasted by others, has exposed uh, so much of our society and particularly the inequalities in our societies. It's exposed the non-communicable disease burden and the risks uh, and where, who, in, who and where is at most risk. And many of these are structural issues that need to be addressed. And it's within that context I've been invited to speak to the health side of this agenda and again thank the opening remarks for highlighting so much because there are core determinants of those preventable uh, deaths I've already introduced and one of them is the area of physical activity and that's the area I represent at WHO and wish to speak to because at its core are the very movements we were talking about and that is walking and cycling. And they really represent the win-win, win-win-win, really, across so many areas that today and prior to this and following this we'll be talking about. But looking at the role of physical activity, it's already been mentioned, it, it, it itself could prevent um, up to 5 million deaths if the world was more active. And yet a quarter of the population are not active enough in adults, and many adolescents are inactive in the sense not getting enough opportunities and the level of physical activity to build lifelong enjoyment and then go on to a healthy and active lives. What I would like to do in my time is to pick up the agenda that I think has been building across your previous discussions and central to this uh, session and that is how do we implement the actions, the policy, as Zulika mentioned, we have to put walking and cycling more at the centre of the policy, but we have to move from the policy documents to actions. Uh, and I'd like to speak to some of the contributions and work underway by WHO with many of you uh, to, to facilitate and contribute to that. So if I could have my first slide as a preview to the areas I'd like to touch on in the, in the next next uh, few moments. And really, this is a resource for the audience and uh, delegates uh, for after drawing your attention to uh, the source at the WHO website. But one of the policy documents that we've got to build the bridge between health and transport and to strengthen the position from the health side is the most recent global action plan top left of this slide, showing you and, and presenting to the world a roadmap for how we can increase the physical activity, addressing the problem I've, I've mentioned, not just for those who are least active, but for everyone to be more active. For physical activity through walking and cycling, the most common and popular and utilitarian ways that we can be active, uh, to be at the centre. It was launched in 2018. It sets a goal that's aligned to 2030 for the very reason of that win-win, win-win. It can improve health and help achieve uh, a sustainable uh, development target 3.4, uh, the non-communicable disease but of course by working on this and health we can contribute to many of the other sustainable development goals. In the text somewhat small but for those that will look back at this you will see that walking and cycling is center to the global action plan on physical activity. Another central and new focus for that document is its place on the environment. It's about the opportunities, the equitable and safe opportunities for walking and cycling. Again, Zalika indicated the basic facilities must be in place. The implementation and enforcement of road safety and standards to ensure everyone of all ages and abilities can walk or cycle uh, uh, as they choose in a safe environment. The Global Action Plan is available, it's online. We're working with many countries now to see that implemented. And 
just this week, and that's why it's such a pleasure to join you uh, at this time, we have launched the underpinning evidence of how important implementing that global action plan is by the launch of the latest 2020 guidelines on physical activity and sedentary behaviours. This is shown in the bottom left. It's available now. We launched last Thursday. And of course, it has within it the evidence of how walking and cycling can not only increase physical activity and, and therefore pre prevent the, the non-communicable diseases I've mentioned, and how that provides physical benefits and mental health benefits. And just to return to that theme of COVID that was really overarching our context, of course, how important being active and mental health has been very, very much at the forefront. The guidelines are available. They provide another policy tool for why we must increase investment. They're levers. In themselves, they say what should be said, but they must be used. I invite you all to um, familiarize yourself and to support our dissemination of these tools because they're the underpinning consensus of why walking and cycling, physical activity contribute to health, health contributes to sustainable development and achieving the future and society we want. To support that and to continue the theme of tools for policy and action, in the middle you'll see active. Active is our tool kit of saying what exactly must we do and what are the actions and who can take them. And I'd like to forecast for the audience that WHO across the house, working with our colleagues in sustainable mobility, urban health, and my department, health promotion, we're working to update WHO's policy position on walking and cycling, bringing together previous documents that are still true and need to be reinforced into one single document that can provide a resource on why walking and cycling is important and the 10 policy actions we need to do. It will reinforce the road safety calls, including on speed reduction, including on infrastructure uh, and design of the environment for safer uh, access and safer walking and cycling. It goes beyond just the safety though, because we need to enable and promote we need to invite and reinforce that walking and cycling can be part of everyone's day. They have a right for that and it should be available and safe for all. The toolkit I'm referring to will be launched in the new year and I look forward to everyone supporting and engaging with us on that because it only is there to contribute to many other documents but to bring WHO's position to the forefront. It's also complementing, of course, the third ministerial um, uh, meeting on road safety that has now extended into the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly. We need to work harder. We need to turn the, the policy and the commitments into action. And my last uh, point to highlight is the document on the right. And I want to recognize the extraordinary amount of work, many on this call and contributors from very uh, wide range of organizations into developing the tools that can make the investment case, the, the uh, economic analysis of why investing in walking and cycling is beneficial. And I'm referring here to the heat tool developed by um, the European World Health Organization's office with collaboration uh, by many. It's currently under development to be now a global tool, a tool that could be used in Tanzania, uh, through in all areas to sh show how and why it, it makes good financial benefits, the investment arguments, which have been lacking in this space. And we need to ensure and, and, uh, um, and use tools to um, garner the resources to implement the policy actions. I mentioned it's under development, not only to um, allow and apply the relevant um, components to make it applicable outside of the European context, but it's also been expanded to give um, outputs in the area and make the connection to the benefit, the win-win in air pollution, the win-win in, of course, health, and win-win in terms of return on investment. So look forward to the updated version of HEAT. Look forward to the walking and cycling policy position uh, on uh, from WHO in the new year. And please 
I invite you to use the current guidelines, the new guidelines on physical activity to support the work. And of course, under the umbrella of the Global Action Plan on Physical Activity. But all of this sits within the broader global health. COVID has really highlighted the inequities and the agenda of looking at prevention and being prepared in our health systems and working across from health into other systems. So let me finish by just saying, it's essential that health and transport build on the networks we have, but are strengthen those. This meeting's important, networks that are being established in regions are important. And WHO looks forward to bringing our voice our action and leverage to this agenda. I thank the organizers for the opportunity to provide opening remarks and I hand back the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona. Very compelling figures you started with and uh, we certainly look forward to those tools and, and the very clear policy guidelines that you are uh, providing. Thanks very much to, uh, to, to your unit and to WHO in, in general for the efforts that you are doing. Uh, we've heard it, 25% of us adults are not active enough. So I think uh, you know uh, the message is very clear. We have to reverse that trend and the tools are there. Thanks Fiona again. And um, our people in the audience is pretty impressive. I mean, we are at 85 participants. I've been checking a bit in the, in the chat. We have people from different places. I think we've covered the Americas. They, uh, I mean, I've checked, we got people from Vietnam, from Mexico, from Algeria from uh, from where else from indonesia so i'm pretty sure that there's many more thank you very much for joining us now we're going to listen to you we just want to check that you're awake even if it's in the middle of your night and we're going to move to a bit of an interaction with you so this is the moment where um you check uh, your slide there somebody will also be uh, inserting in the chat box please that code so you pick up your devices you go to menti.com and you introduce that code there 31680005 on your screen and also soon uh, in the chat box to be typed by one of our colleagues. And let's play. We're not in the same room altogether, so it's difficult to do it by a show of hands. So we're just going to use uh, the digital tools to help us. So when you are ready, um, we're going to get started with the first question. And the first question is just like, you know, generating a bit of a cloud of words. Uh, what comes to mind when you think about the nexus between transport and, and health? Just type type a couple of words. What really comes to mind? And let's see what cloud of words we are generating as we do this collective exercise together. I'm curious to see what's, gonna, what's going to, uh, to come up there. Ship, are you going to be sharing um, that cloud with us? Lovely. It's our colleagues in the back. There's a lot of magical hands in the back keeping us happy, you know, on the IT front and on the uh, on all the logistics. So don't be shy. We really need to see a um, couple of thoughts there. So some people in the chat box are letting me know that perhaps they got a different question when they logged in. And um, perhaps that might be because you skipped to the following question. So the sequence is this one. If you go too fast on the application, you might be going to the next question because we do have three for you to play with. Okay, so walk, cycle, air quality. Absolutely, we can see how central you are seeing all that. You see me tilting because I'm trying to, of course, follow everything that you are um, uh, inputting on my screen. Mm hmm. Okay, let's give it let's give it a bit more time because I see that we have just a few answers and there's many of you online. So I just want to make sure that we can capture family friendly. Ha ha. Accessible, active traveling, and so we we clearly it's, it's it's phenomenal to see how all of you are really connecting that notion of fair quality walking, cycling, isn't it? Uh, friendly spaces to to be in. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. I'm going to give you a couple more seconds and then I'm going to ask you to get ready for the next question because we clearly have a consensus how central it is to quality of life, this nexus between transport, decarbonization and health. Thank you very much for playing. Keep playing a few more seconds with this question. I'm going to do a bit of a countdown, just like five, four, three, two, one, and zero. And we move to the next question, please. So the next question is, 
is not is not sitting on examination, but it's just for us to really grasp a, what we are talking about here. So what do you think is the percentage of the world population that breathes uh, polluted air? Do you think that it's between 0 or 25, between 25 or 50, between 50 or 75 percent, or above 75 percent? Aha, I can see the answers trickling in. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have good students in the house today, Sheila, clearly, and to all the other uh, fellow panelists, because indeed, according to WHO figures, is 90% of us breathing polluted air. Nine over 10 people, we are not breathing the quality of air that should allow us to keep a, a life of dignity for all of us and, uh, and stay healthy to maximize our, our lives across all ages and, and abilities. So compelling, isn't it? Compelling action that we must stay uh, get. And now just a bit, just to check, um, how do you go about, um, yeah, your city? Um, who here joining us today is using non-motorized uh, mobility, non-motorized transport to get around in the city? Is it yes or a no? Mm -hmm. We clearly have got a, <laughs> we're really bridging amongst converted. We understand very well that the follow-up uh, answer here would be like, good, you do it if you had the possibility, because we understand very well that not all cities offer that infrastructure for everyone to go around in the city, walking or cycling in a safe way. But we appreciate a lot that uh, the vast majority of our audience today feels already brave enough to do it, even if the conditions perhaps might not be always the best and, and certainly uh, enjoys it. So thank you very much. Well, now you've now we've checked that you're awake, but uh, well, no, no, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, you've given us the perfect segue actually to go into uh, the first panel that is joining us today. And that first panel is going to try to help us a bit to broaden the discussions, broaden the scope of this nexus between transport decarbonization and uh, and health. Yeah, and it's gonna help us identify those, those policy points, isn't it? Those entry points for a better policy coherence between these two topics. This is a moment in which I please ask all the fellow panelists to put their cameras on so we can see their lovely faces and we can keep this a bit interactive. And the moment where I again ask the audience to keep interacting in the chat box, bring your questions either on chat or on Q&A so we can uh, guarantee a bit of an engaging uh, uh, conversation with all of you. It is my absolute honor to introduce to you uh, Professor Wilkinson, who's a director for Complex Urban Systems for Sustainability and Health in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. With us as well, Rangwen Thornton, who is the CEO of Walk21, and she's also the chairwoman of the Slow Cat Partnership, where I have the pleasure of working. We have with us as well Professor Jonathan Grieg, who is the founding member of Doctors Against Diesel and Professor of Pediatric Respiratory and Environmental Medicine in Queen Mary University, London. And last but not least, we have with us as well, Lee Kriggy, who is the Active Nation Commissioner for Scotland. So we're gonna start a bit of a conversation with our, with our panelists. Let me check that everybody's feeling happy and everybody's uh, setup is, is, is working. Great, here we are. So Professor Wilkinson, let me start with you. And, 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 and please just tell us a bit, um, to what extent can encouraging a shift to, to active mobility, to walking and cycling, achieve like, the vital targets for sustainability and health that we are actually trying to, to run uh, against, isn't it? Professor, please. Uh, well, thanks. I, I, I think Fiona uh, has given a very good background to this already in that uh, clearly uh, physical activity is a, is a vital ingredient for public health. And in the transport sector, I think the active travel is, is an important component. It's not the only component, but it is important, especially because of the uh, connection to health uh, through physical activity. Of course, uh, I mean, there are, there are various pathways by which transport related to health, through air pollution, road injury, uh, physical activity. But of all of those, I think, um, in most settings, the, the benefits that come from active travel are far greater than those that could be achieved through, for example, other measures to reduce air pollution in the transport sector. Um, and probably, although there's some uncertainty, probably by almost an order of magnitude, it's the physical activity that brings the, the greater benefits. So I can give an example of this. Uh, you mentioned the, the, um, the Kush project, Complex Urban System for Sustainability and Health. It's something we are trying to do with the Wellcome Trust, looking at the interconnections between planetary health and uh, local environmental uh, health and sustainability. 
And as part of that, we've been looking at a number of cities around the world, and one of them um, was looking at the options in London. And London has two major strategies uh, for its transport sector, one of which is effectively to, to move towards zero carbon emissions from its motor vehicles, and the other is to increase the proportion of, of journeys made by uh, walking and cycling by active means. And of those two strategies, the active travel one uh, results in health impacts as best we can uh, measure them by, as I say, almost an order of magnitude greater than those from uh, improvement in uh, air pollution by moving towards low carbon emissions from cars. So to me, uh, physical activity is a vital ingredient to any transport policy. Excellent. So if it's about value for money, certainly investing in anything that could uh, boost uh, active mobility as a mode of, uh, of, of mobility could be, could be certainly a policy choice for what you are telling us, isn't it, Professor? Mm -hmm. Where is the, um, as we say in, uh, in, in our jargon, where is the phasing out of petrol and diesel cars and all these? What is the, what is the priority that you think we should be giving to that measure? Um, well, uh, that also, of course, is, is a very pressing priority for a number of reasons. And the climate change um, agenda provides us with time critical imperatives. Um, and, but also an opportunity because um, I think there's great concern, it's now well understood, the, the, um, the adverse effects that arise from air pollution, and actually moving towards uh, climate change objectives has the very same uh, uh, solutions, are the, um, very much the same as those for improving air quality. And I think that for me is why the kind of climate change angle provides such impetus here and the opportunity for improving health. Because to achieve the climate change objectives, Walking and cycling alone won't do it because not everyone can walk and cycle every journey. You can't, um, can't, use, you can't uh, run a lot of commercial activity through walking and cycling. There has to be a motorized transport sector, um, but that needs to be clean. And, uh, and that's vital as an ingredient because transport contributes about, as, you, as was mentioned at the beginning, about a quarter of our emissions for CO2, but also is a, is a substantial contributor to um, uh, air pollution and moving because there is this now the time critical imperative for moving towards away from petrol and diesel in, in motor vehicles I think that, that is also will have the happy con consequence of improving air quality in a much more fundamental way than some of the thinking that's often trying to target individual sources and trying to limit them if we can bring about this transformative shift in the, uh, in the nature of the uh, energy sources we use for our vehicles, that will have a much more uh, impressive and transforming impact on public health. And so there is, that has to be a balanced priority that both have to go hand in hand. The active travel primarily for the health benefits, largely through physical activity, but the phasing out of petrol and diesel because of both climate change and the air pollution impact. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Professor. That is uh, extraordinarily clear. I think the priorities are set very, very clearly to all of us. Let me move to Brangwen Thornton. Brangwen, well, Walk 20 <coughs> uh, is all about uh, uh, walking, isn't it? So, so tell us a bit from your perspective, what is the strength of these ne uh, nexus, isn't it? We've heard it from the, from the health perspective now. Perhaps there is a bit of the reverse link here, isn't it? From a transport decarbonization uh, uh, walking and cycling, sorry, uh, towards transport uh, decarbonization and also towards better health for all of us. So the floor is yours, Rowan, please. So thank you very much, uh, Marusha. Um, yes, I, I hear talking for walking, of course, but I will pick up our important cousin cycling um, in, in my conversation. And I think this is a really interesting um, topic. And I really like what the professor said. It's this combination of active travel and clean motorization that we have to pick up. But as Fiona outlined, the benefits of active travel go way beyond um, clean air and into our you know, personal and our planetary health. The challenge we have though, is that if we only talk about it from a health perspective, um, we lose our transport uh, agenda because traditionally transport professionals, they don't have health in their KPIs. They're not being asked to deliver on a health agenda. They're being asked to deliver on journey times on time savings, we expand our road networks to reduce delay. So your doctor wants you to spend more time walking and your traffic engineer wants to get you from A to B as quickly as possible. So we have a, a basic uh, disconnect 
in how these two professions see their their uh, their core responsibilities, and and this is what we this is what we have to bridge. And so transport agencies started to adopt language around co-benefits. We can deliver co-benefits. Now, these are the sort of things which we see at the heart of delivering healthy communities and, and a great planet. But in the transport sector, these were add-ons, the co-benefits of mental and physical health and social cohesion and community um, sort of cohesion. And so we have to broaden transport's agenda so they can deliver on the positives, as well as not just dumping all the negatives that they have historically done into our communities. And what we are seeing emerging in some of the work and some of the um, research is that there are, of course, direct transport benefits. It's not a one-way street. It's not just transport asking, it's not just health, asking transport to deliver on their behalf. But by delivering active travel, by enabling more walking and cycling in our communities or supporting those who already do walk and cycle, you can actually deliver on direct transport benefits. And this comes across um, a number of transport agendas. So it comes across on delivering public transport, um, underpinning our public transport services, you need commuter catchments that enable people to walk and cycle to catch those. And Washington Metro did a study a couple of years ago, um, which identified their best investment for improving their level of service and increasing their ridership was to actually invest in walkable catchments and to provide safe direct access for walking and cycling to their public transport network. They did the math. So every 10 houses, they increase ridership by seven um, rides per week. This has been reflected in Sydney's Metro. So you need these systems to support your public transport. Road safety, the Stockholm Declaration, which we've heard already about, and the U subsequent UN resolution has recognized that shifting, mode shifting to walking and cycling, obviously with safe infrastructure and proper provision is a way of actually addressing road safety, reducing road danger in our communities. And finally, it delivers value for money for the transport agenda as well. So walking projects can deliver a benefit cost ratio of 13 to one. This is not just through the heat tool, this is which increases benefits extraordinarily, but across 20 different studies, and this work is evolving all the time with more research, we can get some of these extraordinary financial returns for our uh, transport systems. And that's before you measure the zero carbon savings that, uh, that this brings as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, Frank. So return on investment, but so so compelling that point about what do we understand for, for being our KPIs in the different communities, isn't it? And that notion of co-responsibility, if we could if we could share it a bit better. Great. I'll be back to you with a second question in a, in a short while, if you don't mind. But let me move now to Professor Grigg. And we heard Salika very compellingly talking about children. And I really wanted to pick up that point with uh, with Professor Grigg here. So what is the effect of air pollution on, on children? Of course, on children, but we all want to become adults, isn't it? We, we all want to have a long life. So what is the long life, uh, 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 term, long term life effects of exposure to, to bad air quality from early ages? Please, Professor. Yes, thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation to this uh, meeting. Absolutely. Um, the more we are looking at uh, the health effects of, uh, well, basically road emissions on, on children, we, the more we are seeing. But uh, we know that have direct effects, uh, probably in from the womb for the developing fetus. Um, we've recently shown that actually small particles actually get into the placenta. So we can see transmission of particles from the airways right, right through the body. Um, then later in sort of early infancy and preschool, we get more wheezes and cough and pneumonia. So that's interaction with infection. Of course, we have this big issue about what's the interaction between uh, air pollution and, and susceptibility to COVID-19 uh, COVID disease. And that's an emerging area. And then later on in childhood, we see suppression of lung growth or more precisely lung function, because that's what we can measure. So children are not achieving their maximum potential. And this little infographic you see is from our report uh, we published in uh, 2016, Every Breath We Take. And it just shows you the, 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 the complex effects that we see across the life course of the child. And they have implications for later life as well, because if you don't Know, grow your lungs fully, then if you develop other diseases, you have less, less reserve. Many of the diseases we see in adulthood, such as cardiovascular disease, non-smoking lung cancer, obviously have very early origins, so this chronic exposure. So I think it, the, with more we are seeing, we're not just looking at short-term exposures and worsening of asthma symptoms, et cetera, but this long-term persistent effect. For me, it's a bit like a super tanker. You know, you change the rudder a little bit, nothing much seems to happen, but at the end of your journey, you're very much 
different from where you um, should have been. So uh, um, this, this is a really big issue. And so we've got this concept of toxic roads. Of course, that inhibits, may inhibit uh, encouraging individuals, especially children, to walk along these roads. And I think this, the challenges um, to reduce the admissions and say, you no, know, you can safely walk along your main roads and walk uh, and, and in nearby roads uh, without damaging your health. And Paul was quite right that exercise probably trumps all, but we're, we're at this convergent where, you know, we may get synergies between reducing the health, adverse health effects of air pollution, synergizing with the benefits of uh, exercise throughout the whole life course, the potential for that could be really tremendous for a range of non-communicable diseases. Excellent. So what advice would you be given to, to the parents, you know, parents of young kids or, or to young people as well? How do we go about all this? Yeah, I mean, for the individual, this is really difficult. It's really difficult for me when I deal with asthmatics. In fact, we've got a, a very important case uh, in an inquest now where um, it's potentially that air pollution is going to appear on the death certificate of a, a tragic girl who died of asthma for the first time, maybe first time globally, that's going to be you know, identified with an individual. What advice we give to, to individuals is really difficult because of the evidence we've got about how you can reduce your total exposure for children is, is pretty weak. You can give generic advice like know your hotspots, have a plan you know, on a, on a high pollution day in terms of uh, keeping to your medication and making sure that uh, maybe go out a bit later to avoid the, the rush hour, when the rush hour comes back, of course. Um, but you know, if you look at the evidence for this, it's pretty weak. I think you know, that, that we have to really still focus on a national or you know um, urban large urban conurbation interventions which actually reduce the emissions from from roads which will benefit everybody and i don't think we can really give clear recommendations other than be aware of air pollution um, understand that you probably can't make a big difference to your own individual exposure because you have to move around in an efficient way in a in a city as we've heard um, and so that's, that it makes it even more urgent that we change the mix of uh, fleet on our roads and therefore um, reduce it. And of course, in the global uh, scale, um, we also need to think about road accidents and um, the tragedy. And for example, in Malawi, major issue with children being um, injured by poor infrastructure, um, preventing them to actively travel themselves along, along, along these roads. Thank you so much, Professor. So it's a bit of a, an urgent call, isn't it, for action by governments? It's like citizens, we have the responsibility of keeping uh, ourselves healthy, as Fiona and, and Professor Wilkinson have told us, and as uh, Brownwin has also outlined, but then there is the responsibility of, uh, of, of governments uh, to act. And we have a good example of that. We are right now uh, enjoying also the company of Lee Kriege, who is, a, as we said, the Active Nation Commissioner for Scotland. And Scotland has been looking a lot into these, isn't it? You've been very active, clearly, in the past day uh, uh, times, looking into how to, to encourage uh, this nexus between uh, transport decarbonisation and, and healthier lives. So tell us a bit more. What have been the things you've been up to, um, Scotland, lately? Well, I mean, like everywhere else in, in the world, since March this year, Scotland have seen the same trends. Um, since lockdown, people are walking and cycling more than they ever have before. And it's now generally accepted that, that the reason for that was because directly because of less cars on roads. And so we've been given this opportunity in Scotland to for our decision makers to have this light bulb moment. Oh, actually, if people are given the space, then they do actually want to be active. They do want to walk, cycle or wheel if it's safe and it's easy. There's given our decision makers lots of confidence to instigate um, some changes to our streets um, that they've so desperately needed over the last few years. Um, and in an unprecedented time frame, the Scottish Government has launched a Spaces for People programme, which has offered our local authorities um, all the time and money that they need to trial changes to their area that are going to make um, walking and cycling easier. 28 out of 32 of our local authorities across Scotland took advantage of that um, and to varying degrees of success that I can go into um, a bit later. But let's just pause for a second there. This is really, really important. Um, the, first, the first thing that I said there was given the right permit, the right conditions, people want to look after their own health. They want to move. And secondly, we can mobilise, you know, it, it, given an emergency, given a crisis, we can mobilise in unprecedented timeframes. 
So those those are two enormous pieces of learning in, in, in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And since then we've announced um, 50 million pounds to make those temporary um, infrastructure changes over the next five years um, more permanent. Um, so very much focused on car reducing and health centred measures um, and also with a massive increase in, in bus. We're all very, very worried about our public health, our public transport systems. And we know that bus in particular is such a vital service for car free households in rural communities. Um, and a recently published programme for government has emphasised the importance of um, these 20 minute neighbourhoods that, that people are talking about. And mm -hmm. um, just how important it is that everything that we need to work, learn and play is within that 20 minute active journey from our doorstep. But, and this is what I've been so excited to hear that this morning from, from the other speakers, that in order to achieve these 20 minute neighbourhoods, we must join forces. And this isn't just between transport and health. This is between town planning, education, commercial services, tourism, even the arts. We all have to speak to each other and, and join up in order for that to be possible. Excellent. You've given us a wonderful segue into the question I wanted to ask Brangwen, actually, because I wanted to ask Brangwen to help us understand a bit better this say, avoid, shift and improve framework, which is such a mantra, isn't it, of the sustainable low carbon transport community. And, and it links uh, terribly well with this notion of, uh, of nexuses between transport and health and, and certainly uh, the aspects that Lee has just outlined about a uh, public transport uh, proximity policy, the 20 minute uh, neighborhood are so linked to this avoid, shift and improve. So Rangwan, help us uh, um, understand a bit better that framework, please. Thank you, Marisha. And yes, we are hearing um, a lot about this framing um, throughout uh, these conversations through the Race to Zero. Um, is at the heart of the Marrakesh Partnership for Transport uh, Climate Action because it helps us imagine all of the components that need to come together. That's what a framing is designed to do, obviously, but it's a way of enabling governments to identify and understand where they need to place, uh, place their efforts. And as we've heard in the conversation today, we've heard it's not just about active travel. It's not just about cleaning up the motorization because all of these things have to happen and they all have to happen in, co in a cohesive, uh, focused way to, to move the agenda forward. And we need all of these things. And so the avoid, chip, improve framework enables us to sit these things side by side. What's frustrating from my perspective to see is much of the effort and the energy is focused on only uh, the improve column, which is where the vehicle technologies and the, um, the, the sort of changing just the way business is normal, business as usual now into cleaner fuels and technologies. And more is focused there than on the other two combined, but they are of equal status in the system and all need to be uh, uh, delivered by our governments. And let's look a little bit at how we can use these. So the avoid, um, we saw in COVID that um, people did avoid travel. Um, and it's about working from home where possible, perhaps different travel demand management exercises, and what's interesting with everyone working from home is it fosters local journeys, which enables people to adopt more uh, localized travel like walking and cycling. And, and uh, this is a good thing, but not everybody can work from home. Not everybody can access their um, job opportunities um, within a walking or cycling distance. And so the avoid dimension of just not going out has to actually include looking at land use patterns so that we are looking at accessibility for our communities. Um, because in many countries, and particularly the poorer uh, global south, the vast majority of people don't have a choice to avoid. They have to travel, um, and we have to support the ones who are already using these cleaner modes like walking and cycling. And this is where the shift component of Avoid, Shift, Improve comes in, because traditionally it's focused very much um, in a, a focus on moving people away from polluted modes and shifting them into the cleaner modes, which is, again, walking and cycling. This is where we sat in the model. And it's critical that we do that for the energy transition, for the clean air uh, transition. And so shift enables us to remember that we have to shift from unsustainable to sustainable modes, but we also need, and we need to create space in our cities for these modes, not squeezing them to the margins. And the other thing we need to, therefore, to achieve that is to improve the infrastructure provision, not just the vehicle technology, and so in my, in my positioning, then we have to come to the improved component here. And that's not just about improving vehicle technology, 
That's mm -hmm. critical. We need to make them clean. We need low carbon fuels. We need lighter, more efficient vehicles, and they will deliver change. But we also need to improve the um, infrastructure that delivers yeah. on the other two components. And the thing with the voice shift improved, it tells us that we can't afford solutions that only answer one question. We uh -huh. have to provide these coherent solutions that answer the multiple challenges that we face, that provide uh -huh. clean mobility, that provide active mobility, physical activity and, and planetary health. And a voice shift improved enables governments to understand how best to do that. Thank you. Thanks so very much, Rowan. So at the end, it's very much about integrated and balanced approaches, isn't it? Across that hierarchy of strategies that is implied in the void shift and improve. And um, Lee, back to you, if I may. Um, well, you are there in that position in which you're actually looking for the, uh, for the uh, or, or taking care and stewarding, isn't it? The, the, the well-being of, of, of your population in Scotland and of future generations as well. What do you think is the, is the biggest threat? Um, uh, towards the commitments that Scotland is making as a nation to, to, to this notion of uh, transport decarbonisation and active mobility? Mm. Well, fortunately, it's not just, it's not just my job. <laughs> um, I think what is coming through so hard in the session is just how important it is that, of, of this joined up, but that is the biggest threat. I think the fact that this is seen as everybody's responsibility across all policy areas sometimes means that it all get it falls through all of these cracks in between mm -hmm. policy areas so that i think is the biggest threat we don't not speaking to each other holding on to our own silos and not considering that we have this overarching um, importance to to all take responsibility for this and especially um to keep a focus on making sure that everybody's voice is heard in this transport is a social justice issue and um, health inequalities um, uh, is exacerbated by transport um, inequalities so we have to focus on on that transport could change that and and that that is really exciting but also pretty daunting i think in scotland um there's a real mismatch between our policy areas and, and putting these into practice on the ground as well. We've got some of the best policies in the world, but unless those can be realised on the ground, um, then, then I think we're, we're never going to go anywhere. Change is painfully slow. Um, and I think, although now we need it more than ever, it feels very much as though with the amount of anxiety that is around at the moment, people are going to ground with the things that they know. And unfortunately, that means that the people that have and we're holding very tightly onto those things that they have. And although I'm sure none of us would ever want to see our kids' lungs filled with toxic fumes outside school gates, people are, are, are keen to be safe themselves and look, at, and look inward and, and look after themselves. And so we really desperately need to make sure that this is made safe um, and fair for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if maybe we need to be practicing what, what we preach more. I'm just wondering if maybe we're missing the point here. I think I think what we so often focus on is growth and attainment and those things are important and they're embedded through our program for government. But I think unless we start, start focusing on this idea that moving um, makes us feel good and brings us joy, rather than it being always about A to B journeys, then we're never going to embed this lifelong um, health and well-being of, of, of our nations. We need to be making sure that our government officials, our NHS board members, our heads of education, our senior ser civil servants, they need to be given permission to be active every day outside or that change is never going to filter down fr from the top. And so I think unless we give though that permission and that space the equal amount of value as our GDP, then yeah, we're in trouble. Well, thank you so very much. I'm a bit, I think there's, if I could ask those who are not speaking to mute their mics, that would be really helpful. Thank you so very much. Well, I was saying this is wonderful. I'm, I'm checking the clock and ah, it's, it's, you know, merciless uh, to all of us. It's ticking and ticking, but let's, let's, keep, let's keep it going a bit more. I think that what you're illustrating, all of you uh, uh, panelists, is that difficult nexus between knowledge, policy and practice. We all dream of knowledge-based policies. We all dream of sound policy that then is put into practice, but sometimes it's difficult, isn't it? So let me extract a couple of threads that I've been seeing in the different Q&A chat box and, um, and some thoughts that you've provoked in me and, and perhaps throw them at you if you don't mind. And, and we use the next day 12 minutes or so to, to bounce back. And I'm gonna be prerogative of the moderator. I think I will give 
the floor first to Professor Wilkinson because I think he was the, the most rigorous of all of us, you know, in his minutes. And, and I would like to, uh, to, to hear a bit more from him. But then, then just chime in. I mean, I heard many different things. The, the cultural aspect, the culture change aspect that Lee has brought up, isn't it? The feel better, feel feel the joy factor how do we use that factor to actually help with the behavioral change because a lot of this is behavioral change as well isn't it and um, we heard as well in the chat box aspects about intermodality but we that's the way we like to talk about uh, in the transport sector how we make sure that the different modes the different options are there but are they actually there can we improve that notion of, uh, of giving people different options that take them out of the private car and um, there was also in the chat box um, um, uh, people talking about um, fuel efficiency, that part of the improved equation that, um, that um, Brangwen was presenting. Uh, there is all this transition towards electric vehicles, but not the whole world is going to be able to transition towards electric vehicles. So what is the importance that we should still attribute to better fuel efficiency in uh, thermic, uh, in, in internal combustion engines until we can all electrify? And I also wanted to throw at you another point, that point of um, responsibility of different stakeholders, particularly governmental stakeholders. Do you feel that we give them the right type of information? Do we feel that we convey the data in a way that is palatable to them and that can help them better understand the cost of inaction, but also the, the economies of scale and the savings that are uh, uh, implied in these nexus between transport and, and, and health? So let me stop there because that's already a lot. But I don't know if any of you would like to, uh, to, to pick up on any of these. I think there are still more questions coming up. I'll try to read them as you respond. But yeah, the clock is merciless on us. So please, uh, perhaps first, Professor Wilkinson, just like, you know, to be a bit fair from the moderation <laughs> side. And then any of you, just keep on going, please. Um, well, I'll make a few brief comments, if I may. Um, the first is that uh, I think the health argument is always very important in motivating change. And, and, and that, for me, is crucial. But People are also motivated a lot by quality of life and perhaps more so um, by what happens to them in their everyday. And the thing for me is that I think as people have begun to realize partly through the COVID um, uh, restrictions, that there are different ways of thinking about the way the world might work, the way they might uh, work, uh, travel and so on in the future. And it's also put much more focus on things which are contribute healthily to lifestyle. Um, I think there is, uh, growing understanding of the potential improvements in quality of life and the benefits that may come from that. So it's not just about counting dead bodies or whatever, uh, you know, of making a kind of very hard health argument. There are things that have material benefits. But I do think there are some complexities too. Um, I'm not entirely convinced of, of the wisdom of home working um, because one of the things that we've seen is that, yes, it cuts down travel, but travel, if, if particularly for active travel, means people are less physically active and they have less social contact. And there are many reasons why it's not so good. So there is balance needed. Um, I'm very much approved of having more local working and so that people are within distances that they can get to by walking, cycling, and so on. But cutting out travel to places of social interaction through their, their work, we need to be careful what the right balance is there. And I think the last comment I just make about, can we, um, uh, well, I'll, let me confine it to the question about what's the, what's the value for the improvement in energy efficiency. Clearly, that is still going to be a factor. But I think one of the lessons we learned about the diesel crisis is that if you, the diesel investment in Europe anyway, uh, in the diesel um, industry for, for motor cars was propelled by the argument that actually diesel cars uh, emit lower CO2 uh, foot per kilometer of travel compared to the petrol engine. And therefore, there was a gain to be had. But that was unfortunate for two reasons, because the first thing is it just perpetuated and embedded a still dependence on fossil fuel technology in motor cars. And it's put, us, it's put us back two decades, essentially, at least, because we spent all that time trying to develop diesel technology, whereas we could have been putting all that investment into electric or hydrogen fuel cells and so on. So I'm always a bit cautious about where we go. And as we know, the diesel car turned out not to be so good for health. So we have to be very careful. I think there is an argument still for improving energy efficiency, of course, um, around the globe. But for me, I would like to see as, as much shift as possible towards investment in alternatives that aren't dependent on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Professor. I would like any of you now to jump in. I'm going to be a bit, a bit merciless. 
on the other panelists because they took a bit more time than Professor Wilkinson at the beginning and the clock is ticking and I would like to wrap up this in like six minutes or so. So that means that each of you would have two minutes max to pick up on anything of what you've heard. So who wants to go first? Tell me, looking on my, on my different screens here, see who gives me a cue. Uh, yeah, uh, Jonathan, please, Professor Greg, go ahead. Just very, very briefly, um, I think one thing that academics can contribute to this argument and obviously with the data, but we, we actually are very poor at communicating with uh, policy makers, encouraging joined up thinking in government. Um, we don't like to stick our heads above the parapet and um, uh, and become advocates. I think that has to change. Um, that the evidence for you know the health effects of uh, fossil fuel emissions, the need for changing to alternative fuels, uh, is so overwhelming that I think we should all be on board of that. And I, I would include also my uh, my colleagues as clinicians, and I think that they're also a very important uh, voice, which they they really haven't engaged that that well in the past with the um, with the changes that has to come have to come. Well, that was really brief. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and very powerful, nevertheless. Brown, I, I can see you jump in there. Go ahead, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll jump in as actively as I can in, in my office. Um, just to say a couple of things. I want to reinforce the concept of joy in our journeys. I think travel has become something we endure to get from somewhere nice to somewhere else nice. And the bit in between has been devalued. And I, I really liked, we, we focus a lot on that at Walk 21 and to put that joy um, back into, into our travel. And as, as someone coming from the civic society, I would uh, echo the comment about academics joining things up, but to start to work with governments on joining up these agendas at the top so that health and transport, like in Scotland, from the top down, like in Switzerland and other places, they're delivering on the shared agenda. They're not delivering on competing agendas. And as a community, we can ask for that. Excellent, shared agendas. Uh, Lee, last but not least at all. <laughs> well, that, I, that fills my heart to have heard both Paul and Bronwyn talk about um, the importance of uh, behaviour change at a joy uh, level. That, that is just, that's, that's music to my ears. And I think just to em embellish a little bit more what Professor Wilkinson was saying there about his concern, I don't want to be a doom and bloom merchant, but I too am incredibly concerned. Um, that of course um, our our new focus on on digital technologies um absolutely fantastic and it's going to reduce all sorts of unnecessary journeys but let's not lose sight of what that could mean especially for our children um when I, when I hear about where, where we're going um, in terms of our education systems and encouraging more screen time in our children more of an emphasis on digital technologies we have to keep this in check um, with with what it means to connect with people and, and with nature. Um, so yeah, I'd be really happy to hear that conversation move away from task-focused journeys um, to recreational movement and a co-joining of those two things. Excellent. Well, it's incredible. We were five minutes late, but you've caught up so fast that I think uh, let's do something. Let me give you the opportunity, really like one minute each max, almost like a tweet spirit here that one message that you would like the audience to, to retain about these strong nexus that you've actually helped us demonstrate very, very, in a very palatable manner between transport decarbonization and health or any entry points that you think we should be actually optimizing for that policy coherence between the two uh, policy communities. So let's, let's do it quick in whatever order, whoever feels ready to give us that uh, pearl of wisdom to close with, um, if you don't mind. So who would like to go first? Come on, let's tweet live. There's live tweeting going on, so you know you might actually get uh, get tweeted by the team, uh, the magical hands in the back. I'll just say, if, if you don't mind, um, I think uh, uh, this generation of children have the right to um, walk, cycle, and move along non-toxic roads. Wow, excellent. Who would like to go next? Brown, I see you're muted. Go ahead. Okay. I I think uh, people are dying from inactivity, but people are also scared of going out because of dying from road danger or air pollution. So let's address all of those fears by delivering a system that is safe, clean, and enables people to move happily uh, in our communities. Thank you. Who would like to go next? I'd, I'd like to add the message that I think we've all touched on, which is that a uh, healthy transport system is also an attractive future for the transport system. It's healthier, it's cleaner, 
it's something we'd much more enjoy using and the sort of journeys we could do. So I, I think we need to be very positive in the outlook of, and the way we present it. So healthy, sustainable transport is attractive. Lovely. What a powerful message. Lee, you're left again, last but not least. <laughs> Um, I think I think um, if I had to if I had to really condense things which you're asking me to do, then it would be just to reiterate that transport is a social justice issue. We've got a responsibility to address our inequalities through transport. We can. We've seen that we can. It's really exciting that we can. Um, so when we are anxious and fearful and we want to jump in our cars, um, then it's worth considering who can't do that and the effect that that's having um, for not people just on the other side of the world, but children on the streets um, right, right where we live. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for the panelists who really help us demonstrate to what extent this nexus between transport and health is, is, is as much about climate action as it is about uh, equity and social justice. Phenomenal. I really wish I could steal time from Sheila and the next panel so we could continue talking. But this is about, you know, being fair to everyone. Thank you so very much. If you could now turn your cameras on, off, as I will do myself, and we will pass on the floor to Sheila. Big round of applause virtually to all of you. Thanks for making it so easy. Sheila, over to you. The job is now for you. Hi, and thank you for passing the floor back to me, Marusha, and thank you for that panel. How uh, interesting and stimulating it was, and what a thorough discussion, I think, of the links and the impacts between how we move and, and how our planet fares as a result, uh, and how we all fare as individuals, air quality, climate change, personal health, very clear links there. Uh, and a real focus on the need for change, change in city design, change in the way our vehicles are made and, and, and how they move, change in the way that we choose to move ourselves. Um, but I, I, I don't in any way wish to be a voice um, of, um, of negativity here, but in the end, we are a very long way from solving these complex problems as they were described by more than one of your panelists. And even if in Europe, which, um, uh, or, or the Northern hemisphere, at least in parts, there are some changes that we should be excited by, uh, you know, developments to clean up the vehicle fleet, uh, some policy changes to encourage cycling, individuals being appointed uh, with those roles, for example, like Lee, and even political rewards, you know, Mayor Hidalgo in Paris with her 15 minute city being returned to office. This just isn't quite so true and isn't quite so straightforward or easy elsewhere, where in fact, in many ways, it's not so much about a need to shift. It's kind of about a need to avoid shifting from what can often be a more active mobility um, a framework towards a motorized one. So what we have now in our panel, and if I can ask Carly, Clarice, Emma and Pravna to switch their cameras on so that I can introduce them, I think is a really unique opportunity to hear from people who work on the front line in some of the tougher places to actually um, enact change uh, uh, as I say, in a more challenging setting. So we are very lucky to have these four women. Uh, I'm particularly delighted that I'm heading up an all women panel here. These four women whose experiences and work cover four major areas of the world. So we have with us uh, Carly Coynange, who is from UN Environment and heads up their Share the Road program. I think that was referenced earlier. Uh, and of course, Carly has a great perspective on mobility in Africa. Uh, we have Clarice, um, Clarice Link from ITDP. Uh, and uh, Clarice is particularly engaged in Latin America, in Brazil in particular. So we have that perspective. We have Emma McLennan, who uh, heads up the East Partnership, and I'm sure she'll tell us more about the precise geography of East, but largely Eastern Central Europe, uh, where some of the challenges are, are really tough, even though for many of us, they feel quite close to home. Actually, it's quite a tough setting. And then we have Pravna um, from Pravna Bora from Clean Air Asia, who directs their India program. So um, thank you all for joining this panel uh, and for sparing time to talk to us now. Um, and I suppose reflecting back on what we've been hearing in this first panel and in the presentations we had from Zalika and Fiona, 
um, and thinking perhaps a little bit more about your experiences, as I said, on the front line. I wonder perhaps if I can start with you, Carly, whether you can give us some reflections on how you've managed to link issues around health, mobility uh, together, the changes you've managed to, to achieve uh, in the work you do with Share the Road in Africa. So a reflection from your perspective. Thanks, Sheila. It's been such an interesting conversation so far, and I'm glad we can keep talking about walking and cycling and the role it plays. Um, it's, it's come up a few times, and what's really interesting is this, this challenge around different entities and agencies having a silo approach. So it's actually, you know, the work we do at Share the Road is very much about supporting governments in Africa, um, think, rethink transport and prioritize the majority, which is always people who are walking and cycling, making up to 70 to 90% modal share. But generally the, the way we work is we find a political champion who has an issue that they want resolved and it tends to be a very specific issue so it could be congestion or it could be air quality um, and you have to go in and we have to provide support in that particular area with that ministry and we we invite the ministry of health and we'll invite ministry of education and tourism but actually getting them in the room and making commitments outside of their kind of main focus is still a real challenge so whilst we bring in the different challenges and benefits and impacts across the different areas the the people who tend to want to do something about it it's where their budget line is linked so it's still it's still a huge challenge i'd say thanks carly and and clarice promoting cycling in rio i know that's been one of your more recent focuses again what are the challenges and experiences you've had in getting to the point you're at now which i think is pretty close to some real policy change but you can tell us more Hi Sheila and hi everybody, it's wonderful to be here with you. It's pretty early here in Brazil, but it's exciting to listen to all of you. Um, so I think we had, we had, we are a little bit in a game changing moment in Rio or so we expect. It's not recent that we have been working, uh, pushing for cycling policies in Brazilian cities. Uh, but now with COVID and you know, we have one of the most um, problematic situations globally and in particular in big cities like Rio, what we saw is that uh, ma the mayor uh, uh, and the, the secretaries uh, started getting quite anxious about how to avoid uh, the overcrowding in the public transport system and at the same time avoiding a lot of congestion in the city. And um, they, they reached out to us and to some other civil society organizations as well asking for solutions. How could we help them? And for us, it's, uh, it's something so, so obvious, right? And so we took this as an opportunity, although it's difficult to use this word in, in this right moment, opportunity, right? But we understood that this was really a game-changing moment for the city. And we helped them um, uh, through a very collaborative process with different secretaries uh, to, to devise a plan uh, uh, for a rapid implementation of experimental cycling facilities. So at first, we were really looking at Latin American cities. I mean, it's difficult for us always to refer only to European experience as it's quite different from, from what we are. Uh, and so we were looking at, okay, what Bogota, what Chile, what Mexico City is doing, Lima, um, uh, not Chile, sorry, Lima, and Lima and Quito. And, and so we, we helped them understand uh, how could we do something fast, building on existing uh, critical mass. So what are all the, the infrastructure that we have already planned, that there is already a mapping with society uh, in terms of the demand and the desire, and so that, that they could also more comfortably uh, start implementing them and embracing, adopting uh, them as part of the solution. Looking very specifically at access to economic opportunities, because this was really the way to get the traffic engineering companies like, okay, we need to make sure that we can resume uh, the city functioning uh, towards economic opportunities. But we, uh, we were uh, getting some very uh, important uh, piece of, of, of infrastructure that was planned that serves a lot of residential areas. And we thought that this would give us 
an interesting entry point to expand access to health and to expand access to education as well. And, and I think we can talk a little bit more about it, uh, very much uh, inspired by the, the, the beginning of the conversation here um, with, the, with the other panelists. So we are in the middle of that. I think we are getting momentum and I hope very soon we can have some good news from Brazil because I know the last years we had only bad news coming from here. <laughs> Thank you, Clarice. And you may have noticed up on our screen now is the uh, slide that you offered us to share, which um, clearly indicates this um, approach you've been taking to try to improve cycling. As it's in front of us now, is there anything you want to add to give people a sense of what this is showing? Yes, um, great. What we were trying to do is really, uh, I mean, the city has more than a thousand planned uh, uh, corridors and segments, right? Uh, that, that were mapped throughout the last decade, I would say by different social movements, civil society organizations, even inside the city government in different secretaries like urbanism and transport. Everybody has different ideas about what could be done in terms of cycling uh, infrastructure expansion. And what we did was together with them, we created a, um, a matrix or like a framework for prioritization. And we were looking at uh, how can we secure the access uh, to jobs, to economic opportunities, uh, decreasing the, the demand in public transport. So we were looking, we were really mirroring the public transport corridors, right? Like other countries have been doing as well but putting together different, uh, different layers for them to analyze. So where do we have most um, uh, health units or health facilities? Where do we have most of the schools or uh, educational equipment? And where is most of our transit infrastructure? So we were trying to say, let's not just build some piece of infrastructure and say that it was done, but let's make sure that it is improving access to jobs, but is also you know, connecting, reconnecting the city in a healthier, um, way and um, it, th this really gave us so it's like what we call the PNB the percentage of near uh, a percentage of people near bike infrastructure uh, uh, aligned with all the different um, uh, opportunities in the city like, like that's how we're calling it right and we started analyzing with them okay how long would it take for people to access uh, health facilities by public transport or, or, or by bike or by car. And so that was giving them really evidence because I think um, uh, it's, it's amazing how for us, this is all very obvious, but for the decision makers, it's, it's like someone said in the previous pan panel, they are competing agendas going on, right? And so um, we were trying to make it really very tangible, you know, and trying to connect it as much as possible to the, the, the access to the health facilities issue, which was crucial, is crucial still uh, for most of us, not only for workers, health workers, but for patients as well. So how can we increase access in particular to the low complexity, lower complexity units, which are the entry points for the health system, right? So these are the units that are mapped here. We are not talking about bigger hospitals, but really to the health, health facilities type of units. Uh, and looking at other, and so that's how we started looking at schools as well. How can, you know, we start the discussion about resuming uh, access, uh, resuming uh, uh, for the children to resume to go to school and what will be done next year? How can we really help into, uh, into this debate? We can talk a little bit later about this specific issue of access to schools. Thank you, Clarice. But it's really important that I think we see at this point, having had a conversation which celebrates the concepts, uh, uh, that we see at this point what it can actually needs to look like on the ground. I mean, that is literally a description of how you've provided evidence to the policymakers such that they can conceptualize some of the grand ideas. So I think it's really helpful that you shared that and thank you. I just want to move on now then to Emma and, and ask to ask you, Emma, perhaps reflecting on this need for evidence, how you see this debate and developments in this way, uh, you know, going forward in, in the regions that you work in and, and the particular challenges you face there. Uh, thanks very much, Sheila. I, I wonder if somebody could put my slide up the, that I produced just to give an example. Uh, I think 
the need for evidence, uh, the way we approach it is in many ways, first by uh, publishing research, doing local uh, survey work, uh, all sorts of different things. I should say that EAST works in 15 countries. We work through a, a partner network of local organizations in countries in Eastern and Southeastern Europe, in the South Caucasus and in Central Asia. And uh, they're all mostly they're post-Soviet economies. And so they mostly share a common uh, design structure, a common culture in some ways, and all of them share common challenges. And what we've been trying to do, because uh, a very big feature of those countries is the governance structure is very much focused on silo working. Uh, data is not shared from one department to another. Uh, as, as soon as a new administration comes in, which in some cases can be frequent, the people who you establish relationships with go. So there are loads of challenges. So we are trying to, uh, to share best practice and to share good examples of how good design can work. Uh, we're doing lots of things. The reason I wanted to share this picture is to show that uh, the message road safety and low carbon transfer are linked by design. One of the key frustrations for me is how cities are designed and how they're designed around motor vehicles. And I would say uh, motor vehicles, electric vehicles are still motor vehicles and they're not carbon neutral and they still run over people. So electric vehicles are not the answer to our problems necessarily. We need to think more about making streets accessible. These mostly are pictures that I've taken. You have de streets designed, which are might maybe sort of three or four star rated for cars, but look at the people. There's no place, we're working on a road 100 kilometers long with no place for people and animals to cross. So we're taking things one by one. And in countries like Tajikistan, uh, like uh, Georgia, Moldova, Azerbaijan, we're, uh, and others, we're recreating, redesigning one, maybe one crossing to show you can do it differently. And where we've done it, they've been hugely popular. Uh, we've also been training engineers in new design standards, how to think about land use planning. Uh, we've been working with universities. And I, I want to just raise, because there's a lot of discussion about avoid, shift, improve. Fleet managers, uh, one in seven of the vehicles on the world's roads are commercial vehicles. And you can do an awful lot by training them to, uh, to combine journeys, to avoid journeys, to improve, to have modal shifts, get things moving on trains, other things. There's an awful lot you can do there. Uh, working with schools, we do a lot of uh, examples of safe to home, safe to schools, including we're about to start, here's my air quality monitor, uh, monitoring air quality en route to schools and producing clean pedestrian uh, walking maps, not entirely clean, but better options. So there are quite a lot of things. And my answer to you is you, we have to use every, uh, every weapon at our disposal and including uh, pilot studies, pilot and examples of real world practice that can bring the decision makers and the administrators on board. Um, I know we're gonna talk a bit further, but I just want to point to underpasses. Maybe you could say something about that because bringing gender into the picture is very important too. Perhaps we can come on to that later. Thank you so much, Emma. Yes, we will, I hope, come on to gender later. So. So far, I'm seeing very much a sense that this is about the art of the possible. We need to show politicians and decision makers what can be done. And I know Share the Road focuses on that too. So maybe Carly will reflect on that when we when we go back to her in a moment. But but next, I want to go to Prathna. And uh, Prathna is from Clean Air Asia. And I know your work in India is focused very much around uh, cleaning up the air that um, that is that, that people breathe, and we saw earlier, ninety percent of us around the world are breathing dirty air. So it's crucial, crucial stuff. Reflecting on what we've been saying, you know, the need for evidence for politicians, the tough uh, issues around silos and people uh, in different places wanting different things from these solutions that we're proposing. Would you share with us some thoughts from your perspective and the work you've been doing? Uh, in and around Delhi, I know, but across India more generally.
forgive me, Pravni, you're, you're still on mute. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to be part of this panel. I really enjoyed the discussions. So um, uh, our work as far as Clean Air Asia is concerned, you know, we work in three, three major areas. One is what we call informing policy. So basically research and knowledge support to inform policy. The second area is capacity building because of the lack of capacity as far as a country like India is concerned in terms of, you know, building the air quality management, um, uh, uh, you know, support to policy. And the third area is, of course, uh, informing public. So the way we work is not sectorally, but you know, how do you bring all these two, three sectors together? And from that perspective, at a city level, when we are working on say, supporting the development or the implementation of a clean air action plan, we look at all these three areas in an integrated manner because uh, neither can be successful without the other. So um, contextually, I think um, I'd like to bring in a small example when I'm describing this. For instance, I mean, if you look at the work that we are doing in Delhi, uh, we all know, you know, uh, what the real issues in Delhi are. And if you look at vehicular emissions, I mean, if you look at scientific studies, it talks about only 19% of uh, air pollution uh, contributions being from vehicular emissions. But uh, what we are trying to do is do a more localized kind of an approach where we're studying um, uh, 13 hotspots in, in the city, which have been identified uh, by policy. And, uh, and our focus is particularly three hotspots, where, which are residential, which have a large um, population, if you look at it from the perspective of youth and young people. So the idea is to integrate the policy work that is being done within the context of identification of the hotspots with looking at it, looking at a strategy where you could also look at a strong youth engagement in understanding the issue around that. And if you actually look at a micro level uh, intervention, then you do understand that vehicular emissions does contribute substantially in these particular areas. So, so the idea is to in, involve the youth in an action oriented approach to look at convincing public to move to you know, a, a cleaner uh, or non-motorized transportation uh, perspective or and also use it because you know if you look at smaller areas you know the the distance reduces so obviously there is there's much more capacity in convincing young people or you know the uh, our parents of young children to actually walk or cycle or use you know um, more um, environment friendly modes of transport so the the strategy is that if we can create a model where the public engagement perspective is so strong that it actually drives policy within the cleaner action planning to reduce the you know the um, emphasis on on motorized transport so so that's that's kind of the strategy where we educate uh, people in in smaller areas in in smaller locations and look at micro level interventions which can build up and drive policy so it gives you a perspective from the perspective of the people living in the city Thank you, Pravda. And I know the work you've done with young people has been absolutely crucial in helping to push forward the agenda. And that's actually a really nice place perhaps to go next, which is to think about having again gone from that high level of the general principles here, you know, who are our friends and who are uh, perhaps less friendly in this debate. So who do we need to get on side? Who do we need to work with to get these messages across? You've talked about young people. Uh, and of course, there are other issues around um, ease, the ease of mobility. So safety is one aspect, security is another. We've just done some work with Safety Pin uh, in the area around De Delhi, which revealed that adolescent girls are, are finding large parts of their local areas to be simply no-go areas, and that's really restricting their movements. So we know who our vulnerable groups are, but I'd be really interested to know a little more about how you engage young people and how their voices help to shape the debate. And then perhaps from other panelists who you see in your regions as being the people or the groups or the voices that can help push this debate forward. So perhaps Pravina, you could pick that up first. So uh, I think I like to use the same example so that you know it contextualizes this um, this better. So uh, if you, I think one of the one of the uh, uh, discussion dialogues that has come up is the whole 
fact of bridging the gap between research and action on the ground in terms of the understanding as far as the common man is concerned. So, you know, air pollution becomes very complex when you talk about it in terms of pollutants and you talk about the percentages as far as the contribution to, to air pollution is concerned. So, so what one of the, um, uh, so when we conceptualized the Youth Clean Air Network about four years back, uh, we conceptualized it as more as, um, as a, you know, an innovation solutions group rather than advocacy campaign group. So, uh, so the idea was to use, you know, youth from different backgrounds to, uh, you know, to have a multi-sectoral approach. So we have, you know, technology students and we have medical students and communication students working together. So, so the, uh, the approach becomes, you know, uh, multi-dimensional and, uh, the interesting part is that uh, there is the approaches kind of become simplistic and 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 more uh, more uh, you know uh, accessible to people in terms of an understanding. So um, so what we've done in the Asia Blue Skies program, which is actually supporting the sit two cities in in clean air action planning, which is Manila and Delhi, and I'm particularly talking in terms of uh, of Delhi because it is focused on this hotspot approach in residential hotspots, which have a large number of educational institutions, they have a large number of youth uh, around that area and also you know, a lot of residential areas. So um, if you look at the scientific data, then the generic scientific data says that 19% is the contribution of vehicular emissions. Um, the primary key pollutant in the city is you know, particulate matter. So it becomes a bit difficult to correlate it when you talk about it you know, from an action perspective of addressing vehicular emissions. So uh, what we did was that we engaged the youth in uh, in conducting public perception surveys in these three particular hotspots, talking to people in terms of what they think is the main source of pollution within that area. So there was this conversation with about you know uh, about you know one to one conversations with residents uh, living within those areas and trying to understand what their perception was. And we also tried to understand if if they had you know any kind of health related ailments in terms of air pollution. So if uh, the fact is that more, about fifty percent of the people living in these three locations said they had one or the other uh, kind of you know respiratory issue or something that could be correlated to air, air pollution, not exactly scientific, but of course it's a perception. And uh, the second issue was that you know ninety percent of the people felt that vehicles were an issue, so which is which is interesting because it kind of contradicts the whole issue of the scientific data. But but then you're looking at the whole of Delhi, but here you're looking at specific hotspots. And and so the whole idea that going into the going into the project was that we would look at addressing vehicular emissions, whatever the percentage was. And that's probably where with the, the premise that we started with. And then of course we mapped the data that was generated, the youth report that was generated with scientific data. And interestingly, if you look at the data from the three monitoring stations in this locality, it did show that NOx was the primary pollutant. So it does give you some kind of a scientific, you know, um, answer to what, what the public perception was. And then the second, so, so, so now we're going into the second phase of the project where the youth are going to be engaged in creating car free Free zones, uh, looking at how people in that area could contribute to reducing the NOx emissions. And, you know, uh, we've already started with World Transport Day where we declared car free zones within that area and we had active participation. Of course, this is trying times and it, you know, we cannot only say that, you know, it's because of because of the advocacy around it. But but of course, I mean, I think as slowly as you help people understand scientific data and understand this and, and start the engagement process right from the beginning. Uh, it, it kind of, uh, it, it, it creates a movement and you feel that you're contributing to your good health. So, you know, and it gives it, a it's, voice. That, it's an approach. It, it's an yes. approach. Yes. And it gives a voice as well. And I think that's yes. very, very important. Uh, and certainly when you talk about vehicle emissions in Delhi, we know from the project we run, which is called True, the Real Urban Emissions Initiative, that many have tried to measure emissions in Delhi, and actually they're so bad that it's quite hard to do that. So the way that you talk of people's perceptions, whatever the evidence says, rings true to me. So Carly, can I just come to you and, 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 and ask you how you, um, who you have engaged in the work that Share the Road does in the broader community to help with that push? You talked of the difficulty of dealing with different departments with different objectives, but who, who, who's been your associate voice? Who has supported this work for you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sheila. And I think 
you know, I think it's important to remember that when many of us on this panel are working with governments and you can have you can build really good relationships, but because there's so much change in government ministries being formed and reformed and people moving around that those other relationships with other organizations are so critical because often they have longevity when government might not. Um, one of our key allies has very much been academia and researchers and Prathana mentioned this, this kind of bridge between research and practice. Um, and we make sure that when we have country projects, we always have partners that are embedded in research organizations based in those countries. Um, so for example, when we've worked in Nairobi developing the walking and cycling policy for Nairobi, the University of Nairobi was a key partner and continues to engage and advocate with the city government even years after the policy was launched. I think the other thing we can't underestimate is how important the role of civil society is. Um, and in many of the countries that we we've worked in and developed policies for, actually the organization who is, is leading on the development of that policy is actually civil society. So yes, UNEP has, we have a coordinating role through Share the Road and government is key, but they're working hand in hand. So in Uganda, for example, it was the first African bicycle organization, Fabio, they were the ones who really pushed. So, you know, when UNEP walks away and um, international support walks away, you've got local organizations who know the issues, who can continue to remind government of what they've committed to. So that's right, really key. Um, right now we're working in Rwanda, Zambia and Ethiopia and um, with support of the FIA Foundation and we're really we've already developed national walking and cycling policies but what we're doing now is we're we're saying okay we've got the policy we know what the high level vision is but what are the needs of the individual vulnerable groups people with dis disabilities older people children and um, caregivers and their babies and we're starting the project with just a year of talking to all of these different groups to really understand what their mobility needs are in parallel with government and then using the findings from those consultations and the stakeholder engagement to assist government to reshape how they invest in transport so looking at their investment and um, but what we're not doing is going in and having you know one stakeholder engagement session for an hour with 20 different vulnerable group representations we're actually starting with the needs and just focusing on those needs and it's it's not to say that it's easy because actually there are competing needs and I think one of the worries with government is the more you ask the more you're asked for so we're really trying to the capacity building is not so much how to engage it's supporting government in in being brave enough to go out and engage they know how to do it but they don't do it because they they're worried about what they'll be asked for so it's just really kind of hand-holding it and building that relationship with the different vulnerable groups and, and building trust. So I'd say, you know, the power of academia and also civil society and the role that they play has been critical in our work. Thanks, Carly. And I think kind of building on that as well, sometimes it's just very helpful to give uh, uh, an independent space where people can come together who would not necessarily find it easy on their own turf. And I know in some of the work we've done, we've been able to, to do that uh, around some of the issues, for example, around the food economy work we do. So it's just coming to you now. I know one of the challenges you're facing right now in Rio is translating the work you've been doing, um, showing what could be done into real policy change. So can you tell us a little bit reflecting on what we've heard about how in other places external groups are lending their weight. Can you reflect a little on that from your perspective and tell us how that process is going? Yes, thank you. Um, I think this approach about connecting to different agenda has been something that is really part of the way we have worked in the last decade here in Brazil. Uh, some years ago we were uh, uh, we got really close to the housing agenda, for example, to housing groups, and we were thinking, okay, how does, you know, how does social housing policies and transport policies connect? And we learned a lot out of it, and we understood that we could really help strengthen the housing agenda. The housing agenda strengthen our agenda. At the end, we're talking about a, a, a much uh, stronger and more cohesive urban agenda that, you know, we need to learn the language of other agendas as well. Uh, after that, we started engaging with gender groups, and, and I think now uh, we have such a, a, a much more robust understanding 
about how how gender interconnects with mobility and what are all the different um, challenges that we have, but also all the different opportunities that are given to us the moment we start looking from a gender lens to our work. Uh, more recently, we have been talking about gender intersectionality, intersectionality uh, with the intersectionality with race, which in Brazil, like uh, in particular after the George Floyd uh, episode uh, in the United States, in Brazil, this agenda also became very strong here. And we are now uh, with a whole series of debate about the color of mobility in Brazil, which is giving us so much to think and to propose and to and, and so many new linkages. So I think this this uh, the the connection with different fields as well as the connection with the different sectors inside government is something crucial for us, right? And it's something that even now in the situation of Rio that in, in this, this case that I'm telling you, like in the context of COVID, we looked, okay, how can we really leverage this discussion about uh, 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 expanding the cycling infrastructure, which is something we have for so many years uh, uh, been advocating for. We were first looking, okay, you want us to secure access to jobs so that if people can access jobs without getting contaminated, here's some way to look at it. Let's expand to access to health, okay, to health units, here's it. But we began to engage really in the debate about the impact of the lockdown measures on children, because children are locked down, they are not going to school, and there is already a lot of um, data and movement that UN uh, officials and public health experts are talking about children being really the most impacted groups right, um, more than a billion students across the globe in quarantine and, and what is the impact, not only on their educational process development, uh, so their learning development period, but also in terms of health of being uh, just inside most of them in uh, looking at the screen when there is a screen and when they are not facing other types of toxic mm -hmm. environment. Uh, so uh, we, we looked at that and thought, okay, this is something the municipal governments we really need to address very soon. We had now last Sunday the municipal elections in Brazil, so we have new mayors uh, starting taking office on the 1st of January. Uh, and we thought, okay, this is an agenda that the new mayors will need to address. How are they going to secure the safe access to school if if we can really believe that schools will be reopened in January in, in, in 2021. So building on this and looking at these different movements like you, uh, UNICEF has the Save Our Future campaign, which is really calling for the reopening of schools, making it a priority. Um, we thought, let's really try to bring the cycling infrastructure and the walking infrastructure as a healthy and safe for sanitary leads from the sanitary perspective um uh strategy for this reopening so it, it, all of a sudden we are trying to engage with people that are not talking about transport and cycling yeah. infrastructure they are talking it's about, about taking, yes yeah. it's taking opportunities which were arising it's yeah. uh it's it's is it not called some sort of guerrilla urbanism it's it's doing what we need to do when we see our chance and i think that's really important and very interesting that that's happening in rio at this point emma we have a few moments left and i, I just would like to come back to you um gender's just been referenced by pravna um we've just done some work on the importance of reflecting how women move uh we uh, not only for fairness need good access, but we uh, use sustainable modes the most. And so what we do and how we move is terribly important. Uh, it's not even measured. Uh, how do you reflect on that in terms of the work you've been doing? Uh, you did mention underpasses and that I imagine relates to security, but if you can give us a couple of minutes and then we will have to wind up, I'm afraid. Sure. Um, I think that, it, the, first of all, I should say that gender is a part of every project that we do. We have, we specifically look at gender, we make sure that we're not forgetting it, um, as well as other issues. Uh, and we did a survey, for example, in Tajikistan as part of work that we were doing on seatbelt policies. And we found that just 5% of the drivers out of 10,000 vehicles observed uh, were women. And we're doing work at the moment again in Tajikistan in the Rasht Valley, very uh, mountainous area with a big population, but it, living in villages. And uh, we're looking at women's transport patterns, comparing them to men. And we're finding that 
in winter months, women are locked in, in their homes and women have no access to motor vehicles. Women, uh, when they walk, it's in very treacherous conditions. And the new road that's going to be built by the donors is not taking into account the needs of these women. So something that we're trying to do is not just uh, know about what's happening, but also take that message to the people who are building the roads, take them to the donors. I'd just like to say a quick thing about youth. Um, in Tajikistan, since I'm talking about that country, 70% of the population are under 30. And our partner there is called the Young Generation of Tajikistan. Yesterday, we had uh, a one-to-one -one meeting with the Minister of Transport and them. It was just the three of us discussing road transport issues. And what EAST has done is we try to, I suppose as an international umbrella, we can give a platform to voices for people in the villages through the work that we're doing, to, to uh, women's organizations, people with disabilities in the cities and other parts, uh, and give their, take their voice to the ministers. We try to do a pincer movement, um, and not just with the decision makers in the country, although that's important. If you only talk to the official in the countries where we work, the mid-rank official, it's not like the British civil servant. Those people are powerless. Unless, sometimes, unless the president signs it off, it cannot be done. So we have to have a pincer movement where we try to capture the vision of the decision makers, but bring the voices of the people at the ground level. And that's, that's not an easy job, but I think it's a very, very important job. And uh, just on underpasses, under, overpasses, they are when the designers, when the donors are building roads, that's their tick box. That's often the, the they, they just at the end of the project, they suddenly realize, oh, there's no way for the people in this village to get to the school on the other side of the superhighway. Let's put in an overpass which is completely inaccessible, uh, completely useless if you've got a mobility problem or you're very elderly. Uh, and it's, it's dehumanizing and it's just wrong. So we have to speak not just to nas nations or cities, we need to get the donors on side. And very recently we had a, a, a meeting internal with the European Bank to talk about just this along with the, the people from NACTO uh, who do the city design guides, which are so wonderful and so encouraging of cycling and green spaces in cities. And it was really, really good event. Good, that sounds very positive and thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, I do now have to draw this session to a close. Marush and I did do a deal that we wouldn't um, rob each other of space as we went along. All of these panels could go on much longer. To get the chance to pick you four brilliant women's brains would be my idea of the perfect day, but I do have to wrap up. And my notepad is covered in words. Uh, this is my own personal mind map. There are so many things that got raised here about the importance of evidence, about the importance of bringing groups uh, in who are affected, giving them a voice, the importance of design, uh, the importance of taking our chances uh, and being clever and making and fighting for change whenever we see opportunity. So I think there's lots there for us to think about. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Marisha now, whose next panel, I think, will actually talk a little bit more about some of the evidence that can be drawn upon. But thank you, all four of you, for finding time to talk to us today. It's an absolute joy to spend time with you. Thank you very much indeed. Take care. Thank you very much, Shilene. Thanks to that power uh, women panel that you had there. Pretty, pretty impressive. So yes, we're getting into the last segment of the day uh, with a clock that again is ticking merciless on us. And we're going to try to look at uh, who is it that we have to engage. So we started uh, making the case, isn't it, about this nexus. We continued a bit with broadening those uh, those objectives. And now we've seen how things happen in the real world. Let's take a moment now to understand a bit better who needs to be engaged and how we actually uh, make that happen in perhaps a bit more uh, collaborative manner than, than what has happened so far. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you, and I'm going to ask our fellow panelists to please put their cameras on so we can see their faces. Excellent. Thank you very much. And um, so with us today for this panel, uh, Jean Bernard, who is researcher in the International Council on Clean Transportation, uh, Anomita Roy Chotduri, who is uh, the Executive Director for Research and Advocacy at Center of Science and uh, Environment, and last but not least, Jane Burston, who is the Executive Director in, Claire, in Clean Air Fund. So um, 
Joanne, there's been a lot here, uh, isn't it, about um, uh, identifying the right actors, identifying who, who's doing what. It was also interesting to see that in, in one of the uh, chat uh, comments, there was something about, well, how, how quickly can all these change? Well, difficult, difficult to actually promote change if we are not uh, uh, knowing who are the change makers, isn't it? Who are those that are really uh, um, um, uh, provoking a bit of an acceleration in the change? So could, could you tell us a bit more of who do you think are the new players in this world of transport decarbonization? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, first of all, I'd like to, to say that I'm, I'm very glad to be, to be here in that, in that panel. Um, so um, maybe let me introduce the, the TRUE initiative first before I answer that, that question. So TRUE stands for the, the Real Urban Emission, right? This is a partnership between the uh, FIA Foundation and the International Council on Green Transportation. Uh, with a shared interest in, in cleaning up vehicles and improving urban air quality. So the, the problem was clearly identified in the aftermath of diesel gate, right? On, on papers, vehicles were really clean and not really in the real world. And especially diesel actually, in regard to their um, nitrogen oxide emissions. And I must say that was just not Volkswagen only, that was actually all diesel vehicles manufacturers in Europe, with sometimes even more emissions or more than an order of magnitude higher than what advertised. So um, I want to say also that this is not, not just for Europe only. This is actually also for the rest of the world, because first of all, the Euro regulation is being used everywhere in the world. Uh, and also because those cars that we produce in Europe are exported elsewhere. So just to give you a, maybe a number, uh, we estimate that the excess NOx emissions from diesel lead to about 38,000 premature deaths in the world. So that's the amount of emissions. Um, the, these excess emissions uh, lead to premature deaths that I mentioned, but that's the amount of deaths that we could have avoided if vehicles had been, let's say, emitting as what the regulation expected to do. So to come back to your question, maybe briefly, um, mm -hmm. what I see as a major uh, actor now, and also what we see as true, is cities. Cities because they have the power also to, um, let's say, create low emission zone, that would uh, maybe ban one of the most uh, highly emitting vehicles, um, but also consumers. And that's also another part of, of what we plan to do um, as part of the true initiative is to inform consumers in order to make them um, take the right choices, cleaner vehicles, and in the end, uh, zero emission vehicles. Uh, of course, uh, walking and cycling is even better, like we mentioned, uh, but we think it's the right uh, path to go. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, everyone. Um, Anamita, I'm going to I'm going to go to you. You work very hard, isn't it, in air pollution in India? And we've heard uh, over the past couple of hours now the complexities, isn't it, of of policy mixes, of of politics as well, of of things that fall through the cracks, say, of the different silos there of of government departments. Tell us a bit more about that complexity of uh, of of working in air pollution in India. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, uh, this is, I'm really delighted to be here and share, uh, you know, our insight and experience with you. So, yeah, that's a very, you know, a question that matters so much to us. So let's look at it in, uh, at India first. Here, every year we get a shocker, you know, and the shocker is how many people are dying because of air pollution. And so when we get to know the latest that we heard that more than 900,000 people die every year and uh, highest infant deaths. Now the scale of that public health emergency and the level of ambition and scale of action that you require. And to get that, how do you move policy? And more important, as you just asked that, how do you move politics around it? And that's the critical question that we have been facing now for the last 20 years. So let's understand that a little bit. And what is very clear to us that in a country like India, where the standard policy approaches, the top-down policy approaches are not the standard way of driving change, you know, because of our weak institutions, not so strong legislative and the legal framework, weak deterrence and compliance, so in that kind of a scenario, how do you move action? And I think that's the learning curve that we really need to tap. And that learning curve is that we have still been able to move action in this country 
because of power of evidence and the power of using the evidence to empower public opinion. And that we have seen, though even though not uniformly across the country, but at least wherever there has been a bottom up pressure where the evidence has been co-owned and there's an ownership over that evidence, just not by one group, but by diverse actors who can bring an effect change. So the civil society, the regulators, judiciary, media, all of them coming together to understand distal information, to know how to move change. And that's what we have seen, and to give an example specifically from the transport and the vehicle sector, we have seen that today, if we are tom toming the fact that India is the only country in the world to have leapfrogged to Euro 6 emission standards within three years, now that was made possible because there was such a strong local diesel campaign in this country. Because of the whole pressure building up and there were attempts to make, to get people aware through that what diesel air pollution is doing to the health. So when people saw the dirty lungs, when people understood the toxicity of diesel emissions, when we got the data to show that what is the real world emissions from our vehicles and what it means in terms of toxicity, deaths and illness, that kind of ultimately catalyzed the big change. And so it's interesting today that we, this is, so therefore the changing politics means that there has to be a, there has to be popular demand for change. Mm -hmm. And that's what changes the politics. And we have to work with that method going forward. But this is not going to be easy because our issues are getting more complex. And there were the demystification that is needed for people to understand not only just the problem, but also the solution to be able to put their weight behind that uh, strategy so that we can also fight the pushback because it is not so simple to say that we've asked for it and we've got it. You also need evidence to push the industry pushback. And that's what we have to do. And the final uh, thing is that this is about technology and change. But when it comes to mobility, the way you and I commute in our cities, the battle is actually harder. And it's ironical that in a country like India where majority walk, cycle and use public transport, that does not catch the political imagination. We have not been able to convert that the voice of the majority into a voting right, mm -hmm. you know? And that's where we have to now think through how to move forward. Wow, wow. A lot in there, a lot in there. Very connected as well with what Joan was saying, the power of evidence, isn't it? To, to raise awareness as you were telling us and to empower empower people, then transforming that empowerment into change in politics is the is the medium to long-term challenge from, from where we're here. So thank you very much. Jean, I think this, this resonates tremendously, isn't it, with the role that a philanthropy like a cleaner fund can, can have, that notion of, I don't know, enabling environments, introducing disruption at an acceptable level. Tell us a bit more, what do you think that uh, the philanthropic sector can, can offer into, into this tricky equation of politics, isn't it, and policy mixes? Um, yeah, thank you. I uh, absolutely the role of philanthropy is um, is to help support these actors in um, in creating disruption and uh, creating the evidence base and also kind of forming the popular opinion that the animator is talking about is absolutely essential for change. Um, one of the major themes that I've been hearing throughout this event is also um, the importance of building bridges across different and between different sectors. And I think that, um, uh, you know, between between transport and health and children's health and climate change and planetary health sec sectors. And um, as Anarita just said, an emphasis on the diversity of actors. So I think one very critical role that philanthropy can play is the convening role, um, bringing together different people from different sectors, different walks of life, um, to find and then scale solutions across traditional divides. Um, I mean, I, I really liked Emma McClell McClellan's point from earlier about 
um, you know, EVs aren't aren't the panacea. It's, it's quite easy in sustainable transport to to quickly jump to electric vehicles. And I think if we don't work together um, uh, and, and make sure that we're, we're providing solutions that work for everybody, then um, we, we do quickly jump to solutions like that. Um, Emma was saying they do also run people over. Um, and I'm afraid to say they also produce air pollution too. Um, I, was, I was quite surprised to find out that in Western Europe, uh, about 50% of particulate matter from road vehicles is from resuspended road dust and breaking tire wear, um, which obviously electric vehicles will be producing as well. Um, so, you know, they're not the silver bullet. They, they obviously are, are part of the solution, but we also very much need to encourage active mobility and use of public transport too, and avoid what happens when different groups are focused on one, one issue at the exclusion of, exclusion of others, um, which is situations like uh, we saw with Dieselgate. So I think, I think philanthropy can absolutely bring people together on the issue and, and help build bridges like, um, like we've been saying is, is super important across this conversation. Th that actually is, is part of the function of the Clean Air Fund. Um, we're, we're very much about bringing together different types of philanthropic organization um, to work on the cross-cutting area of air pollution. And um, our donors are from climate, trans health, early childhood development. And we also see huge links with um, social justice has been mentioned extensively, equity, um, economics and education as well. Um, and that, that mix is very much represented across our grantee base too. I think the, the other two functions that um, philanthropy can play are one, making the funding flows transparent and bringing additional funding into the mix from um, official donors like development agencies. Um, one of the things that the Clean Air Fund has focused on is uh, understanding how much uh, funding is flowing to the issue of air quality. And I have to say it's a, an incredibly small amount compared to the scale of the problem, uh, but making, making that transparent to people and uh, showing where the funding is flowing to geographically, I think will help increase that funding. And um, when people see, you know, on the one hand, the, the huge impacts on our health and um, quality of life and our economies. And on the other hand, the teeny amount of, of funding that the, um, the, the topic gets, especially in places like Africa that have less than a percent of, of the funding flows that are currently going to the, to the topic. Um, and also I, I've seen in other, in other topics, philanthropy quite successfully bringing in the, and catalyzing the billions that can be accessed when looking at kind of development agency support, other official donors and private sector investment. Um, the second thing, that uh, additional thing that I think philanthropy can bring is, uh, as you mentioned, Marucha, funding things that other donors find hard to support. Um, so more innovative practices, building the evidence base, um, uh, and, the, and, and providing, so helping to fund solutions that can then be scaled up. Excellent. Well, and, and how topical, isn't it, Jane, Jane, that notion of putting the spotlight, following the money, uh, putting the spotlight on the geography of the money and on the gaps that that money uh, flows are, are, are living, isn't it? I, I was thinking, how topical is it that right now, as we are in this, uh, in the midst of all the recovery packages that we know, well, constitute a, an unprecedented amount of money. Never, never in history have, has that amount of money been disbursed in one go, but so many countries at a time and so many other entities at a time. So that say uh, that notion of following the money is going to become absolutely crucial. And I think it links very well with the points uh, that, that John brings to us as well. To some extent, uh, we don't we don't treasure what we don't measure, isn't it? So so I would like to ask you on a bit. To what extent do you think um, that data? Uh, for policymakers at the city level, it's it's available in the right type and in the right amounts. And, and what are your thoughts about that? How can we improve on that front? And, and what is the difference that such data can make uh, for, for policymaking at the, at the very local level? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, I think one of the key words is making sure that we are gathering uh, data in the real world, right? 
uh, so that policymaker can have the, the facts and not just the advertised value from what the, for example, manufacturers can, can declare, but what really vehicles emit in the real world. So that's the kind of things we should be looking at. Um, and, and maybe let me then uh, mention one of the two, or let's say the two objectives of the, of the true work that I've mentioned already. So one is indeed to collect and publish real world data to raise the awareness of the magnitude and the scope of those excess uh, vehicles emissions. And the second one is to support uh, CD efforts to inform consumers with transparent emissions data. So this is very, very, very important. Uh, on that first point of collecting um, for that, for that objective, if I may um, ask for the slide again um, that I prepared. Um, so we, we've selected for uh, the true work, uh, a specific technology that we call a remote sensing that captures vehicles emissions of thousands of vehicles per day. You have an example here uh, on the second picture uh, where you see a car and, and a device. So that technology uh, remote sensing is, is known to uh, be non-intrusive and to measure vehicles in the real world uh, without being noticed. And that equipment can be either you know, um, set above or alongside the road. Uh, it's basically a sensor and a light beam and depending on how that light is being you know, absorbed, you can get access to how much the vehicle is emitting. And that's mm -hmm. very crucial because once you have gathered thousands of, or even hundreds of thousands of vehicles, you can start making conclusions. What vehicle is dirtier than the other? What group of vehicles is dirtier than the other? And that's exactly what we've been doing with, with uh, Paris and London for the, past, uh, for the past three years now, and to give them the right evidence to, to act. Maybe a good example is, is um, how valuable is this data is, is London, the first project we, we did in 2018. Um, so that remote sensing technology helped reveal that nitrogen oxide emissions from those iconic uh, black taxi, uh, you know, most of those uh, taxi in London are those um, black taxis, were actually uh, seven times um, more emitting than what we expected and far exceeding other diesel passenger cars. So even dirtier than other passenger cars. Um, so that kind of insight can be useful to policymakers to improve air quality. In fact, as a response to that, the mayor can manage to uh, reduce the maximum life of those vehicles as taxi from 15 years to 12 years. Um, and um, you know, in other words, uh, he used the result of that study to accelerate the, the, the turnover of the taxi fleet in London. Uh, another example is Paris, uh, where, we, uh, where we found out what, um, that uh, Euro 6 vehicles, diesel vehicles, during very uh, warm summer temperature were emitting even more, 30% uh, more um, nitrogen oxide emissions as we, what we expected. So think about heat waves, um, uh, ozone creation, and all those things are getting worse, even, uh, even, even worse because um, diesel uh, Euro 6 emit even more. Uh, so that's none of the things that are captured in typical uh, emission factors used by um, modeling. So that was also crucial information to better forecast and predict um, heat wave um, related pollution. And, and the last thing I want to mention is informing consumers. And what you see on the on the right hand side of the of that slide is uh, the so called true rating system that we put together that was launched um, some some years ago. Now it's basically using a very simple um, traffic light system uh, where cars are being ranked from either uh, green, which is good, yellow, moderate, or red as poor emissions. And you can you can look up for your car. Um, we're also covering the second hand market. Um, and basically what that figures is telling you that, well, if you, if you buy a diesel vehicles, uh, you will have very little chance to get a, a, a vehicle that is actually uh, performing well for NOx emissions. For petrols, yes, if you get a, a you know, Euro 6 vehicle, you, you have some chances that it's, uh, uh, it's actually performing better. Uh, so that's uh, all I wanted to mention. Maybe as a conclusion, uh, you can see that uh, the, the work that, that we can do by measuring real world emissions can uh, not only directly influence uh, policymakers, but also consumers in getting the right vehicle. Absolutely. And also send market signals, isn't it? Because the moment you are influencing both policymakers and citizens, they, uh, the private sector is going gonna, is gonna to pick it up. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I mean, this is oh. this is what we've seen. The shift from from diesel to gasoline was uh, 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 really impressive over just a couple of years because people got aware of, of of the issue. The power of data, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. That was very also understanding, isn't it? The parameters we are measuring, what is hiding really behind the the lack of granularity of data sometimes, or the lack of looking into the right places, isn't it? And and going beyond the uh, the assumptions of what we think is working or not. So. Thanks very much for that work and, and for sharing it with us. 
And I'm going to go back to Anumita because, well, we started a bit with the difficulties, isn't it, Anumita? The complexities, the politics, and so on. But uh, but there are things that work. We know it as well. Is is a slow is 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 a bit like a marathon, isn't it? Very slow, uh, very long term uh, uh, race. At the same time, with a, with a feeling of urgency that we know we cannot wait anymore. But uh, what has been a the things that have worked? You think? Uh, for, for going beyond the complexities and taking some of these solutions up to scale in terms of air pollution work in, in India? So, all right, this is, uh, yes. So what has worked is really local to begin with. In cities where people of the cities have demanded change and they have seen change. So a city like Delhi today is kind of uh, battling a very bad air pollution, which you all know about, but then because of the public pressure in this city, we have seen change. We have seen this city shutting down coal power plant, banning diesel vehicles, 10-year-old uh, diesel vehicles, putting entry restrictions on trucks, scrapping old vehicles, uh, getting the Euro 6 vehicles. You know, so we have seen the transformation in Delhi. And with that, we have seen change, even though we have still a long way to go. But what kind of lesson do we distill from that? Because it's very clear to us that that change in silos is not going to help us to fight that big battle nationwide. So we have to look at that where the new opportunities are. The new opportunity in terms of the National Clean Air Program, which has today mandated about 122 cities across the country to comply with the clean air standards. Now, can we? And it is already happening that the conversation that is happening in these cities is how do you integrate the vehicle technology agenda and the mobility agenda, the active transportation, public transport, vehicle restraint measures. And they have been able to make an explicit link between these strategies and the clean air goal. I think that's where we have to understand to be intelligent enough to ride on the new policy opportunities that are emerging. And to add to that, let's understand that today, all of us, when we are trying to recover from this such a devastating uh, pandemic-related economic dislocation, and we are all talking about green recovery. Now, how do you therefore influence the government to uh, design the economic recovery package to deliver on clean air goals? So therefore, the production linked incentive that Indian government has announced for the automobile industry, can this be linked with the uh, uh, zero emission mandate that certain percentage of their production has to be electric vehicles? Now that's the innovative inventive approaches that we have to think about today. And we also have to learn to change the messaging, which means that today we, the Indian industry would still want to be very conservative and incremental and slow to move forward. But if we can tell them that today, if Europe is talking about moving beyond the IC engine, if Japan has already announced that, if China is doing it, that in a next decade, the global market is going to change so dramatically that for Indian industry to survive there and to have a competitive edge, they need And Numita, I don't know if it's just me, but I think we lost you. Let me, yeah, I think that other panelists are also having difficulties in, in hearing you. You've, I think it was just a freeze for a moment. Difficulties in surviving, that's what you were saying, and that's where we lost you. Okay, sorry. So, so therefore, what I would really like to say that today we have to look at those opportunities, convince not only the government, also convince the industry that it works in their interest to have a leapfrog strategy for ele electrification, for real world emission regulation, so that they remain competitive. And the other side for the scale that we are talking about, that we see a kind of a mismatch that today, at least in case of vehicle technology, we can think about a nationwide strategy. But when it comes to mobility action, which means having active streets, walking, cycling strategies, then it's all about few streets here and few streets there. We still have not been able to get that, that transformational framework of how to bring that big change for the whole mobility strategy. Here, therefore, we have to be very clear about how do we therefore uh, excite 
public understanding and public support for the, the new uh, mobility gen uh, agenda that we are all talking about here. But uh -huh. we are not being able to do it because you also said very quickly just now that you know what you are not measuring, you can't control. But if you're also not generating how we are commuting, what is our trip length? How do we need to reduce distances? Mm -hmm. How, you know, we only count vehicle numbers. We don't count the way people travel, the, the, tra the trip numbers. Now that's the kind of data that we require to, to build that whole imagination about mobility strategy and how to move forward. So I think we need to have to more imaginative about the way we want to push this agenda forward to scale. Well, thank you so very much, Anumita. Somehow you took us also uh, to the connections uh, with, uh, you connected us with what Brangwen was saying in, in, some, in, in the previous panel, that notion of balanced and integrated approaches, isn't it? Not just looking at a void, not just looking at, at shift or improve, the connection between those three elements of, of sustainable or carbon transport. Very conscious of time. I'm actually getting like, Ugh, if only I could stop that clock. And I wanna hear a bit more uh, about uh, the work that Jane uh, is doing in, in the Clean Air Fund. Um, we heard about the role of philanthropy. Can you illustrate a bit to us, you know, when, when that comes to life, when that happens in practice, um, what can we learn from it? Where does it happen? Yeah, sure. I mean, I was just thinking actually, as Johan and Anamita were speaking of, um, of some really good examples of projects that we've seen and uh, been involved in that, that actively demonstrate some of these points. So I had three, three examples I can talk through. I mean, it's been mentioned several times and Anamita summarised it very clearly and what, what's worked is very local. Um, I think that several speakers have mentioned the need to create the popular demand for change and have clear messages that resonate with people. Um, Professor Wilkinson mentioned earlier that health and quality of life are often very motivating factors for people. So first project that I, I, um, I think people might be interested in is one that King's College, the team that's now moved to um, Imperial College and uh, an NGO called Purpose worked on together. Um, it was basically tackling this issue that people aren't motivated by hearing about huge numbers of global deaths of air pollution. Um, they're motivated by knowing what affects them and uh, facts that resonate with them and that they can relate to. Um, but often there's an absence of those facts when it comes to air pollution. We all know that there's 7 million people a year or more die from it um, and that many millions more have uh, have their quality of life very severely affected. But, you know, do we know how many people in our town um, die? Do we know how many people in our town have asthma um, and how it might be affecting our friends and family? So the project um, looked at that, uh, at how easy it was to come up with those statements and um, actually produced some example statements for towns in the UK and in Poland. Um, the scientists at King's College uh, looked into the data and um, produced these statements like uh, roadside air pollution in London stunts lung, lung growth in children by um, 12 and a half percent. Um, so people can really see if they if their family lives by a busy road in London, this is this is the quantitative effect that it's having on their family, and that is a very relatable statistic. And um, purposes part in the project was to make sure that the Kings was to make sure that the, the statements were scientifically credible. Purposes was to make sure that they were succinct, understandable, and test those messages with with the public. And they've produced. Um, uh, a kind of campaigning toolkit so that anybody who wants to take those statements and use them can understand where they came from and uh, in one co what contexts they can be used scientifically. So a, a really good example of kind of making, making the messages that resonate locally. Um, second example, Johan mentioned, um, as have several other, other speakers over the event, that measurement of, um, of the pollutants is critical. And uh, we agree evidence, evidence is, you know, we've seen it time and time again, contribute to an understanding of the problem, but also uh, appetite for solving it. Um, and uh, so an example there is another one within London. Um, we've worked with a group called, uh, that, that uh, have launched a project called Breathe London, measuring pollution um, across the city at uh, some of the most granular levels ever measured anywhere. 
Um, London already has a really good regulatory grade air quality network mm. and the Breathe London group um, led by the Environmental Defence Fund has put more than 100 um, lower cost sensors, I wouldn't say low cost, but lower cost uh, all around the city and Google have provided um, mobile monitoring by way of having um, a regulatory grade monitor in one of their street view cars and it's enabled us to map neighbourhood at levels that we've never never seen before and um, that's really helped provide a baseline of evidence before the ultra low emission zone was introduced and detect hot spots in uh, places that the, the mayor's office and transport for London never knew existed so that they could be tackled and then the final example um, briefly is <laughs> Anamita was mentioning the need to convince industry um, the Confederation of British Industry recently has calculated the economic consequences of um, air pollution to business. So I think that really demonstrates the, the power of um, bringing industry in and calculating the co-benefits if we, if we tackle it. Absolutely. Thank you. And sorry that I had to rush you there, Jane, but we really need to try to finish it on time. And, and I appreciate very much your help on that. Uh, very powerful messages. Three different examples, isn't it, that connect stakeholders together? Absolutely. And the different roles. I wish we had time for questions with you, and, and but it's impossible. We're really running against the clock. It just makes me think that if we could continue, I would have asked you items like, uh, do you think that we have everybody at the table? Who is missing at the table? I could have loved to ask you a bit as well. And um, how do we introduce the right level of disruption for all these stakeholders to come together, you know, and all, and all these aspects to be scaled up as, as the examples brought by Anamita and by Jane uh, Bringers and, and for stakeholders to use the data that Joan was so, uh, so powerfully presenting. And I would have also loved to, 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 to entertain a bit more the, uh, the notion of, okay, localization, something that we relate, can relate to, but what is the national approach that we need as well in order to enable that action at the local level and to enable us uh, to harness uh, what is coming up, uh, what is coming bottom up. And then a thought that you provoked all in me as well, in this mix of policy making, um, where, is, um, where are the behavioral psychiatrists? We tend to actually uh, not mix fundamental sciences and social sciences when we are doing, uh, whether it is research or whether it is policy making, we don't even listen to the scientists many times. And there is clearly here an element of behavioral change and of culture change that we've been uh, seeing across the across the event. So, well, thank you really very much to, to these amazing panelists. Sorry that I had to rush you at the end of it. And um, this is the moment in which I think, Sheila, you and I, we got two minutes left. So over to you and we close this in style. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Marisha. Well, wow is really all I can say. We have had, I think, an extraordinarily tr global panel and an extraordinarily global audience. Um, and um, my takeaway is we need to work together as two sectors. We also need to work with some other sectors. We are working together, uh, but issues like learning each other's language, uh, moving from policy to activity. And I think we've got some great signals and examples on that. Using all the tools we have in front of us and being opportunistic and a bit disruptive, which is always uh, fun. And I think sharing messages across these two sectors, indeed, within our own sector there's a very active debate going on in the chat about the balance between new vehicle types and active mobility and if only we could all learn that it's not either or uh, and you don't have to shout loud about your bit because you know that's what you get paid to do it's not the only answer i'll tell you that to your face it's part of a mixed bag of solutions and please can we learn we lose nothing by acknowledging each other's role in this uh, this transformation we only gain. Uh, and if we could learn to do that ourselves, leave alone with the health people, then I think we'll move forward. But great panel, great fun, really informative. Uh, and so just thanks everybody for your time, both on the panels and listening in. Uh, and I know Marisha, you'll say a little bit about where next with the en route to COP. Yeah, absolutely. I will. I mean, just thanks everyone. It's been for me, one of the highlight sessions, and we had a nine thematic session, so this has been really fun to, to be with you. Indeed, and Rock to COP26 has been this collaborative effort, as we were saying, trying to keep the community together, connect ourselves as the transport community to other communities that we need to work better with, as the health community, for instance. And I would really encourage you to stay tuned. There will be an outcome document from Unroot to COP26 that will actually try to highlight all these messages that we've been getting across, announce some great ideas that 
that have been coming up and initiatives that have been launched by the different entities involved in the event. And also, why not offer some recommendations, no regret, short term recommendations uh, for action by different stakeholders that we can actually all of us implement, including ourselves as citizens. And immediately, the next thing you can do is actually join us just in a, in a couple of hours, 2 p.m. Uh, Paris time, Central European time, for the closing session, where we're going to try to bring some of these together. And there's a remarkable uh, uh, lineup of panel of, of panelists and speakers there. Uh, but I cannot, of course, close without thanking the panelists and, and, and my co-moderator here and the amazingly engaged audience we had, Sheila, because they were really active in the chat box and in the and in the question and answers. I could really encourage you to keep engaged on social media, hashtag and route to COP26. Otherwise, thanks, Sheila, to you and to your colleagues for the phenomenal uh, uh, collaboration we've enjoyed from SLOCAD with you in the FIA Foundation team. And of course, a special thanks to my teammates in the SLOCAD uh, uh, Secretariat. Uh, they've been uh, phenomenal to work with, as always, my colleagues. Thanks to everyone. Hopefully see you in just a few hours at the closing session. Otherwise, stay healthy and a bit in these uh, challenging times. And all the very best to you and your loved ones. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. <laughs>